All right, guys, welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the stream. Welcome. If you're new, thank you guys so much for being here today. And thank you so much for joining me. And uh, thank you for being patient as well, as always, while the uh, intro finishes up there. Yesterday, I was complaining to you guys about a headache. And we, well, at least I had determined that the headache was likely caused from my ring light. And I was telling you guys that the ring light is actually set up right over here. Um, I mean, you can't see it, obviously, but it was it would actually be right next to my chat for the entire stream. So I'm just staring directly at this intense light. Um, and so I... I have a, I found a solution. I'm happy to to say. So, you know, that should be something that doesn't occur anymore. Uh, midstream headaches from staring at a light. I found a stand that I forgot I purchased uh, a couple years ago and the light is actually compatible with it. So, I'm able to it's actually able to put the stand back there and it's way above now and so yes, hopefully that uh alleviates that problem. Um, but just, just, I want you guys to just have a little bit of appreciation here. So I'm going to turn the light off so you can see how big of a difference it actually makes. Okay. I feel like if, if you don't know how big of a difference it makes, you just take it for granted, right? Here we go. This is what it looks like with it off. Okay. Basically in the shadows. It's, it, you know, what's funny about that though, is my hat, my hat almost makes it negligible on my face bro but anyway yeah thank you guys for being here we have some playstation topics it looks the same don't don't tell me that hold on maybe if i increase i must achieve max brightness all right how about now hmm come on come on you can't say that looks the same you can't say that looks the same but uh, but yeah, let's go over, let's do a rundown of the topics that we're going to be talking about today. Thank you for that, IP Gaming. I'm sorry to hear that, but appreciate it. All right, so here are the topics that are on the docket today. Not a whole lot, I'm going to be honest with you, but something tells me there's quite a bit that we will be able to extract from these topics. Uh, that's kind of the way it goes. Um, gaming news is still pretty slow, but we're going to be talking about a new PlayStation Showcase Shadow Drop rumor, which seemingly came out of nowhere, but actually sounds somewhat plausible and believable. Uh, it's nothing crazy. It's nothing insane, but it I think would I think it would get a certain amount of people excited. Certainly, so we'll talk about that rumor. We'll also just talk a little bit more about you know the PlayStation Showcase. You know how it is during the month of April. It's pretty much just nonstop showcase talk every year with PlayStation. But we're also going to be talking about Sony's continued push, uh, aggressive push, I should say. Um, with PC, we know that this is something that the interim CEO Hiroki Totoki is pushing for. Um, he's made it clear that one of the things he will be doing is continuing an aggressive push uh, to, you know, get PlayStation onto PC to get more PlayStation games onto PC. And obviously, the next big one is Ghost of Tsushima. But there's a big update that Sony brought to Ghost of Tsushima specifically on PC that seems to indicate they are not playing around here when it comes to getting more aggressive. And this obviously leads to the conversation of Sony going day and date with their single player games. We know that Sony is day and date with their live service or multiplayer games. Uh, but when it comes to the single player games, there's kind of a hot debate, I guess, raging on. It's been raging on for a while now. You know, when is it going to happen? Is it going to happen? Should it happen? Would it be bad? Would it be good? Uh, would it really not make a difference at all? Uh, so we'll talk about that as well. Uh, we're also going to talk about Rise of the Ronin and how it seems, based off of reports, Rise of the Ronin may be off to a slow sales start, which I'll be honest is not too surprising. 
Um, and then towards the end of the stream, if we have time, I have an interesting write up here where it says 70% of developers worry about the live service model sustainability. Gee, I wonder why. But yeah, th so these are the topics lined up today. Of course, there might be some bonus topics. You never know which direction we're going to go in uh, with these streams here on the channel. And so before we dive into any of these topics, I want to uh, just, again, shout out everybody watching live. Thank you guys for tuning in. Um, it means a lot. You know, obviously, I couldn't do this show if you guys weren't here showing up and watching. I also want to shout out anybody who watches the streams later on uh, after the fact. I know that not everybody can catch the streams live. So if you're somebody who is, you know, catching the streams later on, thank you for that. Do me a favor, hit that like button. We are sitting at 61 likes. I want to see if we can get up to 100 likes, maybe even 125. We have over 250 people here joining us. So we should be able to do that relatively easily. It lets me know you guys enjoy the content. Three ways you can support my channel, this content, and the community directly. Number one, consider becoming a channel member. You gain access to some exclusive perks. Those exclusive perks uh, include the Members Lounge. Okay, The Members Lounge is in a, it's a place where me and the members, we go there, we lounge around, we hang out, we have some interesting conversations. You never really know what might happen in the Members Lounge. Uh, consider gifting channel memberships if you are already a member. Uh, it's a big thing we do here. I know the community very much appreciates it and it helps support me directly. Last but certainly not least, consider donating a super chat. Give an opinion, make a statement, ask a question, anything in between. It all helps more than you know. So just again, a big thank you and a big shout out to everybody who makes this possible. Um, let's see here. So we're going to start with this PlayStation Showcase Shadow Drop rumor. Now, as most of you know, we've been talking more about the showcase for a myriad of reasons. Reason number one, Sony had their last showcase in May of 2023. So naturally, people are going to assume that if Sony's going to do another showcase this year, there's a pretty good chance it could occur in May. Reason number two, insider... Uh, Jeff Grubb came out uh, about two weeks ago and said that he's heard from his sources that Sony is planning to do a show of some kind, and he is he believes it is a showcase uh, in May, so next month. So these are the two main reasons why we've been talking a lot about the showcase, and of course we've speculated a ton about what Sony could show at the showcase, what could, what they could bring, what we would hope to see. We've talked all about it, and we will continue to talk about it as we, you know, await that announcement. However, today we do have a, another rumor, this time de giving us the name of a game, uh, an explicit name of a game that apparently Sony may actually be planning to shadow drop during this showcase, which is very interesting. Chris Brown, you're saying Icon Era is reporting right now that the PlayStation 6 will have a handheld counterpart and that they are signing contracts with AMD for it. Very interesting. Very interesting. I I have to say, just on a little side note here, I, I don't know if that's true, but I, be, I would believe that for sure. I believe that for sure. Like, I am actually... I wouldn't be surprised at all. I mean, it would be surprising if it was announced. It would be very exciting. But I wouldn't be surprised if Sony is planning a handheld counterpart for the PlayStation 6. I, I could see that absolutely being something that is a way for them to really kind of spice up the next generation and keep people paying close attention. And we have Michael Lynch here with a $10 Super Chat. And I just noticed I have the ability to like your Super Chat, Michael. Interesting. I've never seen this on the channel before. This must be some kind of new feature that YouTube has integrated. Are you guys seeing this? Is it just me? Underneath Michael Lynch's super chat, there's... Oh, that's that's pretty cool. I'm, I've never seen this before. This is the first... Huh. Six likes. Well, there you go, guys. You can you can Apparently, you can now like super chats. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, so Michael Lynch says, whichever one of you geniuses is going to falsely clip MBG out of context, tell your fellow bots to come watch and see 
that MBG doesn't lie like Destin and Eastwood. Well, Michael, thank you for that, buddy. I appreciate you getting my back there. Um, it is, I, I'll be honest with you, like I have not come across anything lately and I also haven't been looking for it. I just assume that there still are some people out there where this is just kind of what they do. Um, I appreciate that. I try my best to be as genuine as I possibly can, you know, while still understanding that, you know, there's an expectation here from you guys that tune in. Certainly. And, uh, you know, honesty and being real, uh, you know, I guess that's the best way to put it, just being real about things. I think that's what people want from all content creators. But, you know, when we're talking about video games, when we're talking about, uh, you know, a hobby that is so wide reaching, there's all different types of people, different types of attitudes. You know, I think that there are a lot of, and I'm not, I'm not uh, trying to start problems with anybody specifically. I'm not name dropping because it's really not that relevant to me. I don't listen to that many people at all, but I know for a fact that there are some very, very disingenuous people uh, that are the opposite of genuine, um, that have large audiences and have a certain amount of influence. And over time, I think it just becomes clear that these individuals will say whatever they need to say in order to make sure that people don't walk away. You know, just to just you know, do whatever you need to do, say whatever you need to say to just keep people uh, clicking and coming back, and 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 you can't risk shrinking in any way. It's pretty obvious. It's pretty sad. And, um, you know, it is what it is, man. So all I can really say is just thank you to anybody who continues to support, support my channel, this community and the content, because I do my best. You know, I've had my moments where I've gotten worked up and very rambunctious, obviously. And I think that's, you know, at this point considered entertainment value. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I do... I do hope that you guys ultimately enjoy the content and get something from it. That's what's most important. And before I move on here, Michael, you're also saying, can you tell who that is in the picture with me? He's on the left. It It's hard for me to tell, Michael. Let me see. That's Greg Miller. Wow, that looks like an old picture, too, of Greg Miller. I'm pretty sure that's Greg Miller. That's interesting. Cool picture, though. So, Michael, thank you for the super chat, buddy. And it, it says here you have 28 likes on your super chat. That's pretty cool. I, I like that YouTube is doing this. I think that's a smart thing for super chats. Um, we also have ACM coming in with a $5 super chat saying, I highly recommend the Shogun TV series. There is an English dub if you prefer. I've actually heard about this. And... I've seen, I think, a couple of snippets from it randomly online, and I'm like, yo, is that Ghost of Tsushima? It very much reminded me of Ghost of Tsushima, and I've heard very good things about it. I saw that it was getting a ton of praise, and um, what is it on uh, FX or something? Where can, you, where can I watch this, ACM, if I want to watch Shogun? Is it, like, is it available on a streaming service? But yeah, it definitely looked a lot like Ghost of Tsushima when I saw it. And I'm like, okay, interesting. It's on Hulu. Okay. And Disney. Yeah, I think Hulu and Disney Plus recently combined and joined together. So yeah, maybe I'll check this out. I'm not sure if Mrs. MBG would be interested in it or not. I'll, I'll ask her about it. But I appreciate the recommendation, ACM. Maybe I'll watch it in preparation for like, Hopefully, what will be a Ghost of Tsushima sequel announcement at the upcoming PlayStation Showcase. But uh, yeah, let's go over this report here when it comes to what might be shadow dropping at the upcoming PlayStation Showcase. This is being reported by PlayStation Lifestyle, an insider who previously leaked the existence of Gravity Rush 2, the Gravity Rush 2 PS5 remaster, now claims that Medieval 2 Remake is in the works, and its release date is sooner than we think. 
Despite its previous denials, Other Ocean Interactive has reportedly been working on this project since 2021. The leaker happens to be a semi-popular Discord member, Orange, who I think actually shows up here on the channel sometimes, uh, thanks to Twisted Voxel, who uh, reported it originally. Uh, he's allegedly a playtester. Either he is a playtester or he knows a playtester who, I guess, is feeding him certain information. We can't comment on the authenticity of their claims or their reputation, but they did accurately leak information pertaining to the Gravity Rush movie in the past. Nevertheless, take it with a grain of salt. According to Orange, we will see the Medieval 2 remake in May 2024, which has led to speculation that it will be shadow dropped during the rumored PlayStation showcase. It's entirely possible that the game will simply make an appearance, but will actually release sometime later, so don't get your hopes up just yet. Orange did not say what platforms the remake is targeting, but it's safe to say it'll be on PS5. And so um, Medieval 2 Remake was first rumored in February of 2020 following cryptic tweets by the series composer. The following month, Other Ocean denied working on the project. Now, Other Ocean is the development team that worked on the Medieval Remake that, if I'm not mistaken, launched on PS4 in 2019. And a lot of people since have been saying like, look, you guys really need to remake or remaster. I guess a remake would be more appropriate, but you need to remake um, the sequel because I think to a lot of people, the sequel is actually better than the original, like quite substantially. So, you know, the idea of this game getting shadow dropped this is, in my opinion, what you really want to take with a big pinch of salt because it seems that the shadow drop idea is just something that peop that fans are hoping for. But people seem to be very confident that there is truth to this. It is worth noting that if we go back to Jeff Grubb, Jeff Grubb, he did say that he has been hearing for a little while now that Sony does have other smaller first-party titles set to release this year. One of those titles is a new Astrobot game. He never revealed what the other titles were or what they could be. He didn't name drop them. The only game he name dropped was Astrobot. And so the idea of Medieval 2 Remake being another one of these smaller first-party games that is ready to release this year, it's easy for me to believe this because it makes a lot of sense. It It's one of these things where, you know, Other Ocean, from what I can tell, did a very good job with the way they handled the remake of Medieval. Uh, so I don't know if it was a huge sales success. I'm going to assume it probably wasn't. It probably just did modest, modestly well, you know, um, good enough. So the idea of Sony, re, you know, greenlighting a uh, remake to the, to the sequel, I don't, you know, I don't think that there's anything unreasonable about that. I don't think there's anything that's like, oh, yeah, I don't know about this one. Now, the question is, how excited would you guys be for a Medieval 2 remake? I know automatically there are going to be some people that are like, really, another remake? And I get that. I get that. But... I mean, to me, this is one of those inconsequential remakes where, again, Other Ocean, separate development team, smaller development team being tasked with remaking a classic PlayStation IP. I don't think this is a remake that people would be upset with. However, I don't think a Medieval 2 remake launching this year, even if it is shadow dropped, I don't think that's going to be enough alone to really move the needle so to speak however speaking of the playstation showcase if this is where we see this game and sony announces it is coming this year let's think about it let's think about it for a moment what could we see at the playstation showcase realistically here's what i think here's what i think i know i'm maybe pivoting a little bit here but I think we will see Medieval 2. I think Sony's going to let us know, hey, Medieval 2, it's releasing this year. I think we are going to see 
a new Astrobot game. And this new Astrobot game is not going to be treated like a massive tentpole AAA release necessarily, but it will be handled with care. I think Sony is going to treat the new Astrobot game as a pretty significant title. Like, hey, this is going to round out our first party output this year. And I think that's good because it will probably be a very good game. And I think that would be a good idea. But then there's also Concord. I think Sony's going to say, here's what you can look forward to for the remainder of the year from our first party studios. Medieval 2 Remake. Until Dawn Remake. Concord. A new Astrobot game. How does that sound to you guys? Specifically for the remainder of 2024. But when we talk about games that are going to show up at the PlayStation Showcase, we're going to see, very likely, Wolverine. Sony's going to show up with Wolverine. Sony's going to show up with, very likely, a Ghost of Tsushima sequel. Saying it's not great. You think it sounds bad? I don't know. I, like the, it to me, it sounds like it has potential. It does. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe I'm a little too optimistic on it, but I think that that lineup has has potential. Oh yeah, and Spider Man Two DLC as well. And we have Dreadful eighty three coming in, dropping five membership gifts for you guys. Dreadful eighty three is kicking the day off, getting this train going. Dreadful83, thank you so much for that, man. Enough from me. We're going to have the games do our talk. Play a Jim Ryan for you since we're talking about the showcase. Really appreciate that support, buddy. So let me add that to the counter here. And just a reminder, guys, if we do hit our goal of 25 members today, at the end of the stream, I will be bringing Boss in, and we will give him some snacks. If we hit 50 members at the very end of the stream, I'll do a couple reps. I'm feeling better today. Okay? So let's see if we can hit that goal. Dreadful. Thank you for that, buddy. My spleen is okay now. Yes, I think I'm a, I think I'm 100% now. Thank you for asking, IP Gaming. But okay, let me ask you this though. Let me ask you this, guys. That 2024 lineup I just mentioned. Medieval 2 remake, new Astrobot game, Concord, Until Dawn remake. It's four games. Two of them are remakes. Two of them would be new games. One of them would be a live service game. Now, what do you think about that lineup? But also, Sony shows up big with games that are, again, they're not ready to release this year, but we are going to show you. You want to see some Wolverine gameplay? Here's some Wolverine gameplay. You want to see some Ghost of Tsushima 2? We got some Ghost of Tsushima 2 for you. Maybe, just maybe, if we're pushing it here, new Naughty Dog game. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, I forgot about that as well. Silent Hill 2 uh, Remake. Although, that's not a Sony first-party game. But, yeah, Silent Hill 2 Remake is also launching this year. So, actually, yeah, we could throw that in the mix. It's actually not looking that bad, I got to say. I got to say. I'm in, I'm in agreement with, I see people saying that they think that's a pretty good lineup. I, I, I have to say I'm in agreement. I could understand, I could understand why some people are a little bit like, oh, I don't know about this. If you're not into these games, but I never played Until Dawn. So for me, that's basically like a new game. Same thing with uh, Medieval 2, actually. I did, I think I played the Medieval remake. I'm pretty sure I did. And it was pretty fun. Wasn't anything mind blowing. Dreadful eighty three coming in with a two dollars super chat, and it's his uh, fifth time super chatting. So thank you for that, Dreadful. Saying he's laughing, and he's saying Baby Steps is going to be big. Yes, Baby Steps. I completely forgot about that. You're probably not wrong, Dreadful. You're probably not wrong. My God, what a, what a crazy weird game. I remember that game was getting clowned on so bad when it was revealed at that state of play. But, hey man, PlayStation exclusives. Death Stranding 2? Death Stranding 2 is 
uh, not scheduled for this year. It's scheduled, I believe, for 2025. So Death Stranding 2 will likely be a holiday 2025 release for the PS5 and PS5 Pro. But right now... Oh, and you know what? The Gravity Rush 2 remaster. Forgot about that as well. That was something that was apparently also leaked by the same source. So we could see that show up. Could that be a 2024 title? Maybe maybe too many remakes and remasters. Maybe. Bug Snacks 2. Yeah, Bug Snacks 2 would be quite the surprise. Dude, if Bug Snacks 2 showed up at the PlayStation Showcase, people would lose it. They would. That would be pretty funny. Uh, we have Michael Meridian here with a $2 super chat saying Lost Soul aside. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with this game. I thought Lost Soul Aside was supposed to be out by now. This is part of that China Hero project. And it's, I think, the most promising looking like AAA game out of the China Hero project. And I was under, I was under the uh, impression that it was meant to launch in early 2024. And maybe it would have been out by now, but the last thing I heard about it is I think the creative director of the game basically said that you're going to hear more about the game later this year. Still no release date, still no release window. Saying it got delayed out of 2024. It sounds like it may have. Yeah, it sounds like it's it's taking a little bit longer to kind of come together than they originally thought. But Lost Soul Aside is an interesting one. That's one I'm I'm paying attention to. But I, I haven't really seen it show up very often. And I think because of that, it just it escapes my mind more easily. But that, yeah, that could show up at the showcase for sure. That'd be a good place for it to show up. We have Techie Six, a member for 10 months, saying Copium, Bloodborne remake for PS5 Pro launch. That is 100% Copium, Techie Six, but it's okay. It's okay. I understand. I understand. Listen, the most realistic thing you could expect for Bloodborne, truthfully, is a PlayStation 6 remake at the launch. That's the most realistic thing, in my opinion. Sony wants to ensure the PlayStation 6 is going to succeed. What better way to do that at launch? Or they want to see it succeed at launch, obviously. What better way to do that than here's your Bloodborne remake, guys. Here you go. For the Pro, I don't think Sony... No, I don't think Sony feels like they need that for the Pro. So I do think that is copium. But however, Techie 6, yeah, see that Hanzo knows. Hanzo knows. What I don't think is copium is the possibility of From Software being part of the PlayStation Showcase and revealing their new PlayStation exclusive title. There have been many indicators, like just straight up direct indications without actually having it officially confirmed that From Software is working with Sony again on a PlayStation exclusive game. But there have also been many rumors. And yeah, there's been this rumor that's lingered for a little while now called Project Velvet Veil. Vale. This seems to be the new PlayStation 5 exclusive project that Sony has tapped from software for. Now, keep in mind, Sony is invested in from software directly. So, in my opinion, that pretty much confirms they are working together on something. Uh, and so the question will remain until the showcase happens. Could we see, will we see from software show up? Mm, that, could, that could be a big one, dude. I'll be honest, if From Software shows up at the PlayStation Showcase with a new exclusive announcement, that will steal the show. I believe. Even with something like Ghost of Tsushima 2, I think that would steal the show. I think people would lose their minds over something like that. Uh, we also have Dreadful83 with another $5 super chat. Really appreciate that, Dreadful. You're saying here, honestly, I tried playing Death Stranding, but it is not for me. And you know what, man? 
I'll give you a lot of credit for being willing to try it. I think it's totally understandable that a game like Death Stranding 2 is not going to, or sorry, Death Stranding 1 is not going to be for everyone. I've always known that. I knew that from the moment I saw the first gameplay, I was like, yeah, this is going to be a little bit divisive. I don't think it's going to be for everyone, but I got to give you credit for being willing to try it because I think that there are too many people with a game like Death Stranding uh, that maybe aren't willing to try it. I will say something I've observed over the past couple of years, though, is people just at random times when we're talking about Kojima Productions or Death Stranding 2 or even Metal Gear Solid, I've seen quite a few people say that, you know what, I, I decided to give Death Stranding a try, finally. And most of them, from what I can tell, have liked it. But yeah, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with giving it a shot. And if you come to the conclusion that, yeah, I just don't think it's for me, I get it. It's a very different type of game. It's a very different gameplay loop. And uh, I am curious to see, like, we haven't seen much gameplay at all from Death Stranding 2. We've seen, like, I think some shots of gameplay that look very, it looks very similar, obviously, in many ways to Death Stranding 1. But I do wonder if there's kind of something that Kojima hasn't quite, you know, hasn't revealed quite yet to kind of like showcase like, oh, and for those wondering how this is going to be very different from the first game, here you go. Or like what major change or improvement was made uh, gameplay wise. I don't think we've seen that yet. I think it was maybe teased a little bit. I think if you watch the Death Stranding 2 trailer, the latest one, they Kojima seems to be hinting that there's going to be more direct combat more gunplay, more shooty shoot things happening in Death Stranding 2. Um, that seems to be heavily implied with that trailer. And I think that's a smart move because I think it's like, look, if you if you do want this game to be more broadly appealing, shoot more stuff. Shoot more enemies. Shoot it is robots now. You're gonna encounter robots everywhere. So, you know, Kojima Kojima's always had this um He's always had this thing, this uh, idea with his games where he wants to not promote violence. He actually wants to promote being passive and and not, you know, taking a non, he, pretty much taking a nonviolent approach. And he did that with Death Stranding 1. But the fact that there's going to be robots in Death Stranding 2, well, hey, they're robots. Be as violent as you want. <laughs> The violence against robots. I mean, you could still, to be clear, you could still be violent against people, actual humans in Death Stranding One, but it was definitely not encouraged. Um, so dreadful. I appreciate the super chat, man. And yeah, I I think we we will maybe see Death Stranding Two at the PlayStation Showcase as well. Uh, I think to be honest, I think there's quite a bit. There's quite a bit that Sony could show in a single showcase this time around. And, uh, you know, when I'm thinking about a game like Medieval 2 Remake and I stack it up with these other games, I, I think it's it's hard. Like, I don't, I don't blame anybody for being like, look, I'm not excited for Concord. Concord is seemingly going to be the biggest PlayStation first party game that releases this year. That's how I'm seeing it right now. So I don't blame anybody for being like, that's not exciting. Because how could you be excited about a game like Concord when you haven't seen it yet? I haven't seen it yet. My hope, though, is that maybe Sony, maybe Sony is going to surprise people. Maybe, you know... Maybe they're very confident in this game. I do want to remind people, and this is important, and I think to point out, Sony bought this studio. They bought this team. They did not have to buy this team. They already entered into a partnership with Firewalk to ensure that Concord would be exclusive to PlayStation and they would help fund the game. They did not have to buy this team. They ended up buying the team from what I understand, because they they were that impressed with what they saw. 
And they really believed like this could be the next big thing or a big thing for us anyway. So, you know, I'm still going to remain as optimistic as I can about a game like Concord. Do I think it'll be enough to, you know, carry PlayStation alone in 2024? Absolutely not. But I feel like if Concord could turn out to be a surprise where it's like, wow, this game actually looks very good. This is much better than what I was expecting. I might give it a shot. And again, you back it up with, oh, and there's a new Astro game. Oh, and there's Untold Dawn remake and there's Medieval 2 remake and maybe even, you know, Gravity Rush uh, remake or remaster for people who are into Gravity Rush. Hanzo says, you saw that burger, MBG. We eating. Yeah, absolutely, bro. MBG's fake optimistic face. I am optimistic. Can you not tell? We have Digital Dude 25 with a $2 super chat saying we'll probably see the standalone Venom game. So that to me is a question mark because this is something, yes, there is a standalone Venom game that's in the works. This was confirmed with the Insomniac leak. And there seems to be some confusion because there were multiple slides with the Insomniac hack that leaked. On one slide, it said the Venom standalone game was actually targeting a 2025 release. On another slide, it seemed to indicate it was actually targeting like a 2027 release. But... I think most people determine that they have to be targeting a 2025 release because a 2027 standalone Venom release sounds a little bit, I don't, I mean, it's certainly possible, but it just knowing that they took out like 90% of Tony Todd's voice lines, it, it just seems like this standalone Venom game might be way more progressed you know what I mean? To the point where it could be ready in 2025. But that remains to be seen. My my real question is in which order we're going to see this stuff, right? At this year's PlayStation Showcase, is it more likely we're going to see Wolverine gameplay over the standalone Venom game? Or is it more likely we will see the standalone Venom game than the Wolverine gameplay? Or could Sony just say show both? It is also, again, worth noting that this year is very likely a two-showcase year. Sony will also have a PS5 Pro showcase that will occur very likely in September. Maybe Sony decides we'll show the Wolverine gameplay at the May showcase and we'll save the Venom reveal for the PS5 Pro. Because don't forget, what was the very first game that Sony revealed at the PS5 reveal event. The very first game they revealed was Spider-Man Miles Morales, the standalone Miles Morales game, and it blew people away because nobody expected it. Granted, people do expect this Venom game, but this is new hardware. The PS5 Pro is a new PS5. It is new hardware. The idea that Sony would say, you know what, let's do it again. Open a September PS5 Pro showcase by showcasing the standalone Venom game. That would be pretty smart. I think that'd be a pretty smart way to handle it. Make sure Wolverine fans are satisfied with Wolverine gameplay. Uh, Now, let me ask you this, though. Is there a chance we might not see Wolverine this year? To me, that sounds unlikely. Considering Wolverine was first announced in 2021, it would be quite surprising if we didn't see it at all in in 2024. Because remember, in 2022 and 2023, we thought Wolverine might be ready to release in 2024. We did think it was a bit early, but we were speculating, oh yeah, this could release in 2024. So the idea of like going all of 2024 without seeing Wolverine, maybe they could do it the other way. Maybe they show the Venom game at the May showcase, and then they save Wolverine for the PS5 Pro showcase. 
Either way, I want to see Wolverine this year. Yeah, Chris Brown, I know. Where's the time go, man? The Wolverine reveal was in 2021. September of 2021. It's been that long. I see Psyduck TV is asking the chat, when is this showcase supposed to happen? Right now, the rumor is the showcase is supposed to happen in May. Very likely late May. Now, I do want to point something out here that backs this up. I forgot to mention this earlier. Sony is going to be giving their yearly quarterly earnings. The big one. The big one. Yearly quarterly earnings report for fiscal year 2023, um, May 14th. May 14th, there is a chance, and in fact, I say there's actually a pretty good chance, Sony might have some bad news for their investors. Not all bad news. They will have good news, but there might be some bad news. Some of that bad news might be, you know, PS5 sales are slowing down. Did Sony, did they hit their goal of 20 million units sold that they already had to readjust? from 25 million down to 20 million? What if they only hit 18 million? Uh-oh. Investors are going to get spooked. So the idea of Sony having a showcase locked and loaded and ready to go immediately after their earnings report, and when I say immediate, I mean within a week or two, think about that. Even more evidence, timing-wise, that Sony is going to go full-blown showcase mode in, in May. Um, right after their earnings. I'm very interested in, in learning about their earnings as well because I, I don't know, man. Sony had some lofty expectations for fiscal year 2023 and it seems like maybe they were a little too ambitious. So I'm curious how close they have gotten to hitting some of those goals. But... Yeah, generally speaking, I think it would be very wise of Sony to do something like a shadow drop at their next showcase. I remember Microsoft did this with, uh, I think, Hi-Fi Rush in January of 2023, and people loved it. They were very surprised and delighted. And then Microsoft had another show in, in January of 2024, and everybody was expecting a shadow drop. And if memory serves, I don't think there was a shadow drop this year. And so maybe this could be Sony's turn of being like, hey, let's try something a little bit different. Let's get people excited. Let's shadow drop a game, you know? Um, maybe a game like Medieval 2 Remake. I don't know. Could that be a title that Sony says, let's just drop it day one into PlayStation Plus Extra to entice people to subscribe? I don't know. I don't know if that game would really move the needle in any meaningful way, but... Shadow Drop Gravity Rush 2 Remastered? I, well, I will say, considering they seemingly have quite a few different remasters here, so we're talking Medieval 2, Gravity Rush 2, and Until Dawn, although I think it's safe to say Until Dawn will not get Shadow Dropped. But considering the abundance of remakes and remasters that they seemingly have on the docket here, Hold on. Marcel, you're saying MBG, he didn't say that it's going to be shadow dropped, only that it's going to be shown in May. It was a journalist's mistake. Okay, well, to be fair and to be clear, uh, Marcel, we we did I did acknowledge that this was speculation. The shadow dropping was not spoken about by the insider. The shadow dropping. Shadow dropping, that sound, that's such a weird term. The idea of them shadow dropping a game is something that people began to speculate. And I just decided to entertain that speculation and think, okay, what are the chances that something like that does happen? Um, so yeah, just to reiterate, that was not part of the leak. Um, I, sh I should probably, I'm, I'm probably going to have to update my title though, because you know what? I am realizing that the way that the title is worded may be Hold on, let me see if I can fix this real quick.
All right. Oh, wait, hold on. I ran out of space here. There we go. Okay, so I, I altered the title a little bit to maybe help try to alleviate that so people are not confused. Oh, the pop my jaw there. Who asked uh, for these remasters? I mean, I'm sure there are some people who have asked for some of these games to be remastered, like Medieval 2 and maybe Until Dawn, uh, but I think it's just important for people to understand that these remasters we're about to see, if Medieval 2 Remake is legitimate, we know Until Dawn Remake is happening, obviously, and then there's also Gravity Rush 2. You have to... My whole thing is just pay attention to who's doing the remastering or the remaking. Until Dawn is being remade by a brand new team called Ballistic Moon. And this is their first project. I don't see anything wrong with that. Their first project to get, you know, just kind of... Just kind of see what they can do until Dawn Remake. Okay. You're a brand new team. I don't see anything wrong with that. Medieval 2 Remake. Again, that's being handled by Other Ocean. I don't think that's a problem. Other Ocean did the Medieval 1 Remake. Why not let them do the sequel? It make, it, if anything, it makes sense. I don't believe we know who's doing... Um, the Gravity Rush 2 remaster, though. What's Blue Point Games doing? Blue Point is working on something new. They're not doing a remake or a remaster. Capono, you're saying I bet Until Dawn graphically will look very good on PS5? I think, yeah, I think so, too. If I had to guess, I think Sony's going to have a very healthy mix of games to show at their showcase. I think they're going to have remakes. I think they're going to have remasters, of course. I think they're going to have some smaller new games. But I think they're going to have some bigger new games. I think we are going to see at least one new IP. I think we're going to I think we're going to be look, I don't again, I don't want to I'm not getting my expectations too high, but I do think we are going to have a showcase this year that leaves people feeling very good. I do think that. And uh, guys, by the way, we have over 400 people here watching, which is great to see. Thank you guys for joining me today. Do me a, a favor. Just take a second and hit that like button. We're currently at 138 likes. Let's see if we can get that up to 150, maybe 175, maybe even 200. It really helps the streams. We have Digital Dude 25 with a, another $2 super chat here saying Horizon Zero Dawn Remastered slash Remake. Uh, yeah, I mean, that is apparently a thing. And that's a tough one, to be honest. To me, that's a tough one because Horizon Zero Dawn getting remastered for PS5 or remade for PS5 is one of those titles that people are going to sigh about. And what I think Sony should do, if this is a thing they're working on, and it's something they want to announce, they need to be extremely explicit, and they need to communicate very clearly that this game, this remaster did like was very easy to do. And like a couple people worked on it. Just, I don't know. They just, they need to communicate that we didn't put a lot of time and resource into it. I think that would be important to communicate because people are going to be frustrated. And it all, and they also have to have an upgrade path. Kind of like, honestly, kind of the way that they handled The Last of Us Part Two remastered. 
I feel like that, you know, where they said, hey, if you own the game $10 upgrade and you get all the bells and whistles for PS5, I think that's fine. Because it's, it's one of those things where it's like, all right, clearly Naughty Dog didn't have to put a lot of resource into this. And they were able to get, you know, out the door very quickly. Uh, in fact, we did learn that when we get these types of remakes and remasters from first party teams, they actually get new hires to work on them to get familiar with the PS5 environment. And I think that's very important to highlight because that could very well be who's working on this Horizon Zero Dawn remaster or remake. Am I going to be excited for it? No. No, I'm not. I, I played Horizon Zero Dawn and I enjoyed it. And I don't really feel the need to play it again. Although, let's be honest. Let's be honest right now. If Horizon Zero Dawn is remade for the PS5, I'm not saying it's needed. I don't think it's needed. But let's be honest, it's going to look mind-blowingly good. So, there's that, right? What's up, Corey? Glad you could make it. <clears throat> what if it's for mobile? Um, that would be interesting. I doubt it. That I mean, that would be a very surprising twist. But... To me, what Sony needs to do, if they announce something like a Horizon Zero Dawn remaster slash remake, you just have to do what you did with The Last of Us Part Two. New hires worked on it to get familiar with the PS5 architecture. Didn't interfere with the development of any of our main games, our new games. And there's a $10 upgrade path. And that's it. That's it. I think that's all Sony needs to do. And don't shine a huge light on it. And everybody will be fine. I think. Corey, you're saying that I missed the rumor slash shadow drop. Um, you kind of did, but I'll just recap it because I've been kind of all over, not all over the place, but we've been talking more generally and broadly about the upcoming PlayStation Showcase whenever that's going to happen. I am, again, the end of May. But to fill you in, um, essentially, there is a... Actually, I think he's at Orange. Is that you? Yeah, there he is. Orange uh, is kind of... He's beginning to build up somewhat of a reputation for maybe being an insider or having an inside source uh, that's a playtester. And according to them, Medieval 2 Remake is happening and it's going to be shown in May. And... It led to mass speculation, if you want to call it that, that the game might even be shadow dropped at the PlayStation Showcase. Uh, now, when it comes to this shadow drop, now, you know what's interesting? I think some people, may, and I'm realizing this now too, maybe some people are reading that the PlayStation Showcase is going to be shadow dropped. Oh, man. Oh, man. Orange, you're saying MBG seems like the showcase is coming May 16th. At least that's what my other friend who leaked Ronin before the reveal told me. He also said that Ronin 2 got greenlit. I actually would not be surprised if Ronin 2 got greenlit because there's just too much potential there. Let me see. Let me go check on the calendar here. May 16th. Well, I did say that... Mm, okay. Y yeah, that, that could work. That, that, that actually could work, dude. That tracks. May 16th falls on the on a Thursday. It's basically smack dab in the middle of the month. And what's also interesting is it's two days. It's two days after Sony's yearly uh, earnings. So if they are going to do a showcase on the 16th, that means they would have to announce it before their earnings report. So they would likely announce it on Monday. Probably even sooner than that, though. They would probably announce it on, let me see, Friday. Well, I don't know. Hold on now. I don't know. Yeah, maybe Friday? Friday the 10th. Yeah, they could announce it Friday the 10th of May or the 16th of May. We'll see, man. We'll see if your friend is uh is legit or not. 
because that would be that would be a great. I mean, it could be a lucky guess, of course. And we have Corey the Legend Landiga coming in, doing some lifting for us today, guys. He's keeping the membership train rolling along. He drops five more gifts for you guys, Corey. But that was some fancy shooting. You know how it is, man. You're pretty good. Pretty good, Corey. Thank you for that. Corey brought us up to 10 members on the day. Always appreciate it. See if we can keep that train going. Let's see if we can end up hitting that goal of 25. And we also have Perfect Image here with a $5 super chat saying old engines. Like I love how <laughs> I love how Perfect Image. I knew it was going to be about engines. He just continues our conversation about game engines. He says old engines like C++ make fast coding hard. Bungie made Blam2 Tiger Engine to excel. Building games on old tech is tough for developers. Also, I'm not hating. I, well, I don't I don't take it as hating, man. Um, certainly not. But yeah, when it comes to the coding side of things, I don't know the first thing about coding. To be completely honest, I, I don't know anything about coding. Um, I know it's difficult. That I do know, but that's about all I know. And I don't know. I mean, I, what what engine does Bungie use? The, okay, the, the Tiger engine, like you said. Destiny 2 uses the Tiger engine, which is Bungie's own proprietary creation. And is a modified version of the comp. Okay, blam. I never knew that. Yeah. So, huh. It makes me wonder if Sony is going to maybe like, I don't know, try to do something more with their engine. Since it's proprietary. Sony's going to be like, yo, Bungie, make Destiny 3 on, the, on Decima. No. No. But you're saying here, Perfect Image, that they made this engine to excel. Hmm. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens, man. Again, we, we did just kind of come off that rumor that Destiny 3 apparently is happening. I agree. I, I like that. I like the name of that engine, the Tiger engine. That's a pretty badass name for an engine. But let me see here. So let's... Let me uh let me get to my closing thoughts on this topic and we'll move on to the next topic, the next set of topics about I guess more generally speaking the PlayStation showcase, Medieval 2 remake, a potential shadow drop that people are speculating. Um my thought process is if we are getting a PlayStation showcase in about a month from now, we will start to hear more things like this. I don't think everything's going to leak. Certainly not. I think there will be some surprises. At least I hope there is. I don't want everything to leak. But I do think a couple things here and there are going to start to kind of come out. Or be, you know, we might hear one thing and then next week it's kind of corroborated by another source. Um, and I think this is just going to be... Basically, it's going to start as a slow burn. I think it is a slow burn right now build up. But I think at some point in the next... At some point in the next three weeks, the rubber is going to hit the road. And it's just going to... We're going to see... We're going to see Sony activate like their next phase, so to speak, for fiscal year 2024 slash 2025. And it's going to be very, very fascinating to see what that looks like, but something that remains true is that Sony has a lot that they could, keyword being could, decide to show at this showcase when when they, you know, host it next month. Um, I do want to say one other thing as well before I move on, and it's kind of answering somebody earlier, somebody in my chat like I think it was even before the show started today, was saying that they really are hopeful that the PlayStation 5 Pro will be shown at next month's showcase. And I just wanted to speak to that for a moment and say it is possible Sony could decide 
if, you know, for whatever reason, maybe they just feel a sense of urgency due to the leaks and whatnot, they could decide to announce the PS5 Pro as soon as next month if that's when they're doing the showcase. But I want to say going into the next PlayStation showcase, I would assume we're not going to see the PS5 Pro. I would not expect that. I think if you're going into the next showcase expecting that, you might be let down and disappointed. We're very likely going to see that closer to the end of the year because that's when it's going to launch. And Sony doesn't want to incentivize people to hold off on buying a PS5. You know, if Sony comes out like today and says PS5 Pro is real, go buy it, or sorry, go pre order it. They're basically asking people to not buy a base PS5. And that's somebody that could have bought a base PS5 now and also a pro in November. And we have Hellbound 1981, another legend, coming in, doing his part, doing some lifting for the community. Hellbound drops five more membership gifts for you guys. So just like that, Hellbound brings us up to 15 members on the day. And uh, Hellbound, I'm going to give you this because I appreciate it, man. Um, it's going to take up most of the screen, but... There you go. There you go, Hellbound. Thank you for that, bro. And Aries09 comes in and also drops a membership gift. Drops a single gift. And I'll use this as an opportunity to just en encourage people and remind them that you can always just drop a single gift. It all helps. It all helps. So, Aries09, thank you for that. Thank you. Appreciate it. We are now sitting at 16 members on the day. We are less than 10 away from hitting our first goal of 25 members, nine away. Remember what I said? If we hit that towards the end of the stream, I'll bring boss in and we'll feed the beast. Come on, let's help MBG spleen single gift train. <laughs> yeah, guys, we, we need a single gift train for my spleen. It's urgent. Thank you for that. Yeah, if we and unknown, yes, if we hit a second goal, if we hit two goals, I'd, I'll do some reps today if we do that. I'm feeling better. All right. So we're going to move on to the uh, next topic here. And before we do that, I do just want to ask you guys one more time, hit that like button. You guys are doing very good today. We're already sitting at 172 likes, so you're you're definitely doing your part. Hit that like button. Let's see if we can bump that up to 200. The next topic talks about Sony's continued push to PC, and this is going to be quite the conversation because Sony has done something uh, with PC that they've never done before, and this has once again ignited the ever-present and ever relevant conversation of will Sony go day and date with their single player games? Is it happening? How aggressive really is Sony going to get with PC? Is Sony killing the PlayStation console? Is there going to be no reason to buy a PlayStation 6? Are we going to find out that there's no reason to even own a PlayStation 5? We're going to cover all this, but we're going to start here with a PlayStation blog write up that came out yesterday about Ghost of Tsushima says here, and this is written up by the online community specialist at Nixus Software. Hey everyone, Ghost of Tsushima Director's Cut is coming to PC on May 16th. So I just want to point out that if that, if what Orange in the chat said is true, that a play, PlayStation showcase is going to happen May 16th, that would actually happen the same day that Ghost of Tsushima launches. It says today we're giving you all the details on cross-play support in Legends mode and the inclusion of a new PlayStation overlay with PlayStation or sorry with support for PlayStation trophies and more. As we've announced previously, Ghost of Tsushima Director's Cut on PC contains the full game, the Iki Island expansion and the cooperative online multiplayer Legends mode. Thanks to crossplay support, Legends on Windows PC can team up with players on PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5 consoles and use in-game voice chat to communicate. You will be required to sign into your PlayStation Network account to access the Legends mode. 
Ghost of Tsushima Director's Cut is the first PlayStation title on PC that uses a new PlayStation overlay, which includes your friends list, trophies, settings, and your profile. This feature is available on Windows PCs and will be accessible from the in-game menu or for keyboard players by pressing Shift plus F1, um, the Shift plus F1 shortcut on your keyboard. And they do show images here, and I don't have them up on screen, but basically all you need to know is that the images of this PlayStation overlay essentially look like the PS5, um, generally speaking. The overlay, it has like a, a tab on the left where it has search, friends, trophies, profile, and they're all self-explanatory. Um, it is worth noting because I did see some people talking about this. There was a little bit of confusion. Is there party chat support with this PlayStation overlay? No, there is not. There is in-game chat support, but not party chat support. So if you're playing Ghost of Tsushima Legends on PC, uh, you will be able to like chat with somebody if you're playing cross-play with a PS5 player, but only in-game. So it's important to note that. It says here, while playing the game, you can earn PlayStation trophies just like on PlayStation consoles. Ghost of Tsushima Director's Cut on PC shares the same trophy set as the game on PlayStation 5 console. In addition, the PC version also has full support for achievements on Steam and the Epic Game Store. To make use of features like trophies, friends list, and crossplay, you can sign in with your existing PlayStation Network or create a new account. The use of PlayStation Overlay is optional for both the single player experience and Legends mode. So, yeah, um, th this is, again, this is a pretty significant, I would say, progression in Sony's PC efforts where they are now saying, listen, if you are somebody who has engaged with the PlayStation uh, ecosystem and you play the metagame, that being trophies, you care about trophy hunting, well, we are now incorporating that on the PC side. Um, and they're, they're seemingly going the extra mile here, at least Nixus is, by also having these same achievements to unlock for Steam and the Epic Game Store. But I think this is a smart move, honestly, because it's like, look, Sony, I, I've always been a believer in if you're going to do this, do it right. And the idea of allowing PlayStation players, or I guess maybe anybody on PC who's interested in these PlayStation games, allowing them to get involved with trophies, trophy hunting, you know, experience what it's like to earn a platinum. I think it's a smart move. Um, and it is worth noting because there also was a little bit of confusion. This is not a launcher. Okay, I, I have seen some people a little bit confused. It's like, oh, is is this Sony? They they did they announce like their own PC launcher? That's not what this is. This is, this is, um, to me, this is more like trying, it's Sony trying to emulate a more PlayStation specific experience. It's, it's like they're trying to emulate like a more, like, for example, for somebody like me, right? Not that I'm I'm not planning on playing Ghost of Tsushima on PC. And to be honest, as of right now, I don't plan on playing any PlayStation games on PC. But it is interesting to me to think that if I were to try that and and, and decide that's what I, I want to do here, there's an option here. There's this overlay that essentially makes me feel like it's basically like the same as PlayStation 5. It's interesting. It's interesting what they're doing here. Um, but the question I think needs to be asked, and I think it's the question that's on the forefront of everybody's mind right now is like, you know, what's the next step beyond this? But let's just continue on here with this blog post and finish the write up. It says when bringing games over from PlayStation consoles to PC, the team at Nixus always strives to give a great experience to as many players as possible. In Ghost of Tsushima Director's Cut on PC, you'll find a range of graphics presets aimed at making the game run well on older hardware, as well as making it shine on high-end PCs. Uh, there's multiple asterisk marks there. Uh, below, you'll find the details on the recommended hardware for various presets that are available in the game. And so, if we're looking over the um, PC requirements, let's see here. For very low, so... 
average performance, the average performance for the very low setting is 720p at 30 frames per second, which, man, I'm going to be honest with you, that does not sound ideal. I would, I would not want to play Ghost of Tsushima at 720p, 30 frames, but all you need is an Intel Core i3, uh, 7100 AMD Ryzen 3, 1200 uh, graphics, NVIDIA GeForce GTX 6 or 960, 4 gigabytes, or an AMD Radeon RX 5500 XT, 8 gigabytes of memory, um, storage, 75 gigabytes of hard drive space, although they do say underneath that an SSD is recommended. And then for medium settings, uh, I'm not going to go over all, because there's a lot, I'm not going to go over every single one, but if you're targeting medium settings, you're going to be looking at 1080p 60f performance. If you're targeting high settings, you're looking at 1440p at 60 frames or 4K at 30 frames. If you are targeting very high settings for Ghost of Tsushima on PC, 4K at 60 FPS, you need an Intel Core i5, uh, 11,400 AMD Ryzen, uh, five, uh, Ryzen 5 5600. Uh, graphics, NVIDIA GeForce RTX 4080 or an AMD Radeon RX 7900 XT, 16 gigabytes of RAM minimum, 75 gigabytes of SSD space. So yeah, that's what you're going to need if you want very high settings and you want to really get the most out of uh, Ghost of Tsushima on PC. See this, but you know, it's interesting because I'm looking over this and Again, this is just where I think Sony is doing it the right way. I, I don't care about PC gaming right now. I don't know if I will in the future, but it is just nice to see that, man, the purchase of Nixus software is really paying off here. Where, like, honestly, if you're a PC player, I think you, you can't help but just feel like, man, Nixus is, is doing some good work here, right? Uh, but we have perfect image here with a $2 super chat saying, this um, this is not new. Ubisoft does this for all of their games. I didn't know that. Well, t perfect image. I didn't get the sense that what Sony is doing here with this PC overlay, I didn't get the sense that it's new. I think it's new for Sony. But it, se it seems like kind of like something that would already exist. And Sony's just now like trying to do their own version of it. But I, I have to admit, I didn't know that Ubisoft does this. All of their games unless hold on hold on one second unless you're saying perfect image you might have to clarify this unless you're saying because i feel like this isn't what you mean because i would have known about this you're 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 almost making it sound like ubisoft has already used this playstation overlay that's not no that that to me that's not surely that's not what you're saying you're just saying ubisoft has their own version right of some kind of Ubisoft-esque overlay? Is there a name for it? I don't know. I don't really... I don't play Ubisoft games that often, but I certainly haven't played them on PC. Oh, you're just saying... You're saying cross-progression? You're saying they all have an overlay. Devil Shooter has been telling us this whole time, MBG. Devil Shooter is a prophet. I mean, it makes sense, though, for these game publishers to, to have something like this. But I don't know. To me, even though this isn't like something that's necessarily new, to me, this is significant. Because th to me, this does mark a pretty big step for Sony in the PC space. Let me, okay, so that, by the way, that does it for the uh, PlayStation blog post, but yes, this, I do want to pivot the conversation now to talking about Sony's future plans with PC. Corey, you're saying, I ran through it on PS5, PC gaming runs better, sure, but as advanced as the tech may be. They're stuck behind the times, ironically whining about lagging so much. Yeah, it. so when it comes to Sony's approach to PC, 
there's something that really kind of stood out to me when I read about this yesterday. You know, I I I expected when Nixa Software put out their blog post, I thought it was just going to show the recommended specs and, you know, just kind of do the same type of rigmarole that we've seen for every other PlayStation game. But this time they were like, actually, we're introducing something new. You know, we're introducing the PlayStation overlay. And the thing that really stood out to me here is when I was looking at these images, how it really does kind of just look like a PS5 over it. You know, it looks very similar to the PS5 UI. And also, of course, the trophy support. And the first thing that kind of ran through my mind is the interim CEO of PlayStation, Hiroki Totoki, if you recall, in February, when he was talking to investors, one of the things he said is in order to improve profit margins and increase them, we are going to get more aggressive with PC and supporting PC. And I remember this specifically because there was a lot of confusion. People were trying to twist what Hiroki Totoki said and they were trying to make it sound like he was saying they're going to go full multi-platform as in they're going to support other consoles like Xbox. And I guess technically they will be with like Bungie, but uh, it seemed pretty clear that they were talking about like the, you know, the PC space. And yeah, that's the feeling I'm getting here, Capono, is that Sony is not messing around when it comes to PC. They are dead serious about trying to like right now and I, or I would say for the past three or four years, it seems like Sony's goal with PC was mainly to just get established and try to make some extra money off of previous games and or past games. And they're still doing that. Ghost of Tsushima is not a new game. Horizon Forbidden West is on PC now, but it's not it wasn't like brand new when it launched. I guess it's it's still new, but it's still a couple years old. Uh, so there's still this just kind of waiting that PC players have to do. But when we see something like this, the PC overlay or the PlayStation overlay being introduced for Ghost of Tsushima on PC, what does this mean? Does it mean what we think it does? Does this mean that Sony is about to go day and date with their single-player games, or they're getting ready to do so? Well, obviously, I can't give you a definitive answer. If I knew, I would tell you. No, I was in a Sony corporate meeting, and no, they're not doing that. I, I don't know. However, there is some speculation that we can do here. There's maybe some inferring we could do, potentially. But the one thing I want to say, and this is very important to note with this conversation, because I know how um, silly these conversations can become sometimes, where you know there are, there are people who I think they say things at times, but they don't quite realize, like, but that's just not true. You know what I mean? And I think they just kind of, in a way, sometimes set themselves up without realizing it. So a couple of things that's, that we need to establish here is regardless of your feelings on PC, you know, like, it, like you, if you hate PC gaming and you love console gaming, um, regardless of your feelings, Sony is multi-platform. I think Boss is trying to get in. Guys, come on. You're going to have... We're going to need nine more membership gifts here to hit the goal because Boss is starting to get get antsy out there. But Sony is multi-platform. And I know that there are individuals on the internet that when they hear that, they just... Their instinctive reaction is no. But I like that is a fact. And there's nothing we can do about that. It's just a fact. Sony is multi-platform now. They are putting games onto PC at a different rate. Therefore, they are multi-platform. Even Bungie, like I said, Bungie's next game is Marathon is going to be on Xbox. MLB The Show is on Xbox. But Sony simultaneously still does timed exclusivity. And that's the important part. So Corey comes in, Corey the Legend Landiga doing some heavy lifting for the community today. And he drops a 10 bomb on us. 
He does it. He gets us over the mark. He does it just in time because Boss is seriously losing his mind out there. I think Boss likes these new treats I got him more than any other treats in the past. So, Corey, thank you so much for that, man. Guys, let's get some W's flowing in the chat for our good friend Corey here. He shows incredible, absolutely incredible support for this community time and time again. And he always comes through. He always he always comes through for boss, man. So let me update this member goal. I'm going to finish what I'm saying here before I bring boss in, though, because I just don't want to. I don't want to get overwhelmed with. Uh, you know, his. His 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 uh, cat league presence here. Why is that not? Oh, there we go. OK, so yeah, I'm going to bring boss in. In a couple of moments, I just want to finish uh, this point here that I'm trying to make with this discussion because, again, I know I know how people can get with it. I just want to make a couple things clear. But before I can do that, we have Chris B coming in. Chris B is keeping the member train rolling. Going past 25, Chris B drops five more membership gifts. And actually, that brings us up to 31. I, I accidentally put 25. Chris, thank you so much for that. So, Corey, I forgot to play this for you, man. Holy shit. That's for getting us over the 25 mark. And Chris. Enough from me. I'm gonna have to get I'm gonna have to throw another Jim Ryan. In there. Which one haven't I used in a while? How about well, I've used I use all of them frequently, but I'll throw Kept you waiting. Throw a huh? snake in there again. So thank you for that, guys. We're now sitting at 31 members. Boss is going to get his treat soon. And remember what I said. If we hit the second goal, if we do hit 50 members today at the very end of the stream, I'll do a couple reps for you guys. All right. Um, but guys, when it comes to the conversation about PlayStation and PC, um, it's it's hard to have a conversation about exclusivity anymore because everything has changed. When we talk about exclusivity for PlayStation, it has to be done, in my opinion, and this is based off of the fact that Sony has gone multi-platform, it has to be done under the framework of timed exclusivity. And I think everybody has come to terms, at least I would assume everybody has kind of come to terms with this, that the industry is just different now. The console, the walled, the walled off console experience has changed, you know? The walls are there when they're convenient to be there, but when they're no longer convenient, they're moved out of the way. And that seems to be the way it's going. And I think that this conversation about day and date single player games, there's a really important um, aspect to this that I want to bring up here. Let me... Uh, Hold on one sec. And I, because I saw people talking about this earlier in my chat, and it's the whole idea of will Sony introduce an actual PlayStation launcher on PC? This is the question that people have because they're, you know, we're talking about Sony, right? They have spent decades with multiple console generations basically forcing people like, you got to come to us. And the way that works, like if you want our games, you buy our console. That's how it's always been. And that obviously changed when they started putting games on PC. But then they also made it clear, like you're getting older games. You're getting older games on PC. You're not <laughs> I think my son's out there yelling at boss. That's so funny, dude. <laughs> They're they're putting games on the PC, but they are older games. So Sony's still kind of like, they're still doing that, right? Like they're still saying, like, for example, right now, if you want to play Spider-Man 2, you need to buy a PlayStation. You need to buy a PS5. And if you don't buy a PS5, you can't play Spider-Man 2. But at the same time, PC players are also sitting there saying, but I don't really need to buy a PS5. I just need to wait. And Sony isn't answering them. Sony isn't turning to PC players and saying, you're right. 
just wait another year. No, Sony doesn't acknowledge that. They don't give any kind of exact timing as to like, here's how long you're going to have to wait. So they kind of leave you guessing. But as more games go to PC, it makes it clearer that like, yeah, you wait about a year, maybe two years, and in some cases, maybe three. That's kind of about when you can expect it at this point in time, especially if they're the bigger games. But again, this is where the question comes into play. Will PlayStation make their own launcher for PC? Well, I have this report that comes from VGC, and this was reported, this was a while ago, August 16th, 2022, VGC um, reports that Sony could soon introduce its own launcher for its PC games following in the footsteps of Ubisoft, Rockstar, and Activision Blizzard. References to a PlayStation PC launcher have been found within the files of Marvel's Spider-Man Remastered when launched on PC, suggesting that the game, uh, that such a, a platform could be in Sony's future plans. VGC has verified the files and has seen the references to the PlayStation PC launcher. This follows the discovery that Sony could be planning to introduce PlayStation Network integration into its PC games. So, it says here, while neither Marvel's Spider-Man nor any other PlayStation Studios PC game currently allows connectivity with PSN accounts, Spider-Man's files contain multiple references to PSN account links and PSN linking entitlements. Hold on, guys, hold on one second. I don't know what's going on out there. G give, me, give me one second. I'm sorry. So I'm sorry. I didn't realize I didn't unmute. I just had I had to bring boss in. He was going absolutely nuts. And uh sorry about that. I just decided, you know what, we're gonna feed the beast now. We're gonna um we're gonna give him some of his snacks because he's I'm like, dude, he's gonna like literally destroy my door if I don't let him in. So uh there you go. Enjoy boss. That is courtesy of this community once again hitting another membership goal. Yeah, he was fighting me off off camera, off camera. Um, lost getting his fix. But before I get too distracted here, um, see, it's interesting because what we see with this PlayStation overlay being introduced with Ghost of Tsushima on PC is that's exactly what you can do, right? Like you can now link your PlayStation Network account, and these were references that were found in games like Marvel Spider Man, the first one when it came to PC. Uh, but yes, there have been multiple references directly to a launcher. And here's where I stand on this when it comes to a dedicated PlayStation launcher on PC. I do think Sony's going to do it. And here's why. I think at some point, Sony is going to go day and date with their games on PC. I do. I, I think that day is not necessarily around the corner. Like I've seen some people saying that they expect maybe even games like um maybe even games like uh like Wolverine, right, to, to be day one on PC. But the reason why I, I think it well, here's what it basically comes down to. It comes down to control. It comes down to Sony unwilling to drop a game, let's say like Wolverine, day one onto Steam. They're willing to drop it day one onto PC, but not Steam. And the reason for that is because you have to understand Sony is very much used to, specifically with their big AAA single player games, getting 100% of the cut. This is what they are used to. And 
there is a risk associated with if we drop our single player games day and date onto PC, we don't know what that's going to do for the console space. I mean, of course, there's this concern. Is everybody going to leave console gaming? No, but could we lose sales on the console? Could we lose sales to Steam, to PC? And the answer is like, yeah, you could. You don't know how many. But the important thing to understand is any sales you might lose, you know, anybody that may decide, you know what, I would have bought a PlayStation for this game. I would have done that to play this game. But now I'm not going to. I'm going to go play it on PC. I'm going to buy it through Steam. Now Sony's getting 70% of the cut, not 100%. So, so there is this kind of risk reward trade-off situation there's there's unknown variables here and the reason why where i think a playstation pc launcher sits here is i think a pc launcher acts as the solution for sony to be able to say we want to be able to release all of our games not just our multiplayer live service games but all of our games including the single player games onto pc day one to maximize sales and launch a game like Wolverine or future games to millions more people. But we want to make sure that we get 100% of the revenue. A PC launcher does just that. Will people hate that PC launcher? Probably. Will there be consternation if Sony does that? Yeah. Will Steam players be upset? Yes. Will people try to fight that? Yeah, could they win? Yes, maybe. But I think that that's the direction we're headed in. You might be asking yourself, well, how come Sony isn't doing that for games maybe like Helldivers 2 and why didn't they do this already for their multiplayer games? Again, it's because I think Sony views their multiplayer games differently. I think Sony, truthfully, doesn't really care that much about the overall sales of their live service games. For example... I don't think Sony expected Helldivers 2 to sell like 8 or 9 or 10 or however many millions of copies it sold at this point. I don't think they expected that. I think Sony just expected a moderate, maybe 1 million, maybe 2 million sales. But they also were expecting recurrent revenue because it's a live service game. Same thing with a game like Concord. Is Concord going to be a $70 game? Is it? Because I'll tell you right now, if Concord's going to be a $70 game, it's 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 multiplayer PvP only. I don't know that it'll be free to play, but if it's a $70 game, good luck. If it's a $40 game. Maybe. But I think it's the monetization that Sony's worried about not the sales. Single player games are the exact opposite. Single player games, there is no monetization outside of the initial sale unless you create DLC. If you create DLC, that's further monetization, but it's still limited. It's not going to be as recurrent as having a player pool that's playing your game every night that you can constantly sell skins to and stuff and currency and whatnot. And so I think this is ultimately what we are going to see in the long run. I don't know, boss, Jesus, man. I don't know if it's going to be anytime soon, but I think Sony is going to develop a PlayStation launcher for PC that if you want our games, our single player games, future Naughty Dog games, future Insomniac games, the future Santa Monica games, the whole, you know, any of them. If you want them, specifically the single-player ones, you will have to buy them through our launcher, and that's where you will play them. I think that's what's going to happen. When it comes to, again, multiplayer games, I think those multiplayer games will launch, obviously, on Sony's own launcher, but they will also launch on Steam and everywhere else. Older games, like we are seeing now, like Ghost of Tsushima, Yeah, put it everywhere. Put it everywhere because it's it's an older game. But if you want 
Spider-Man 3, although, I, again, I don't know that it's going to happen this soon. I, I, I honestly don't know the timeline for this. And it's, it's, it's hard to determine. I mean, could it happen this generation? It could. Could it happen the PlayStation 6 generation? Yes. I'm thinking it's going to happen when it's ready. That, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking Sony's actively working on a PC launcher, but day and date for single player games hasn't happened yet because the launcher isn't ready. I think when that launcher is ready, then that's when they'll be like, yeah, you can now get all of our games at launch day one on PC, including the single player games. But you got to do it through a launcher. That's what I think. Um, I could be wrong about that. You know, Sony might not even know themselves. Sony might still not be totally sure how they want to handle this. Um, because even Sony doesn't know what's going to happen with the console after the, they do something like this. So they have to, I think they are pro approaching it with caution. Like, I don't think they're just going to dive into it. But I, I would be, truthfully, I would be very surprised. And I'm sorry, guys, I'm, I'm leaving you hanging here with these super chats. I'm going to read them in just a moment. I'm just trying to make sure I get all this out here before I forget it. I would be truly surprised if Sony were to just, whether it be a year from now or whether it be six years from now, if Sony were to just come out and say, yeah, we're just going to start putting our games, including all of our single player games, onto Steam day one. That would be genuinely surprising because it would just straight up mean that they are not well, it just means that they've completely changed their outlook on the, on on all of it because I've always been under the impression that the games that Sony really cares about selling, I mean, like we are banking on not just not just like a couple million sales. We're banking on like eight, nine, ten million sales. Those games Sony treats differently, I think. Like they like they very much make it clear like you come to us for this. God of War like Ragnarok when that was launching, you come to PlayStation for that. Spider-Man 2, you come to PlayStation. And I like that's the thing to me that I don't see changing unless Sony can guarantee 100% revenue for every sale. And that, to me, is what a PC launcher would do. And I do think that this PlayStation overlay might be a kind of first step. You know, baby's first step into like, all right, let's just get a little bit more integrated here. PlayStation network accounts, cross-play trophies. I think it is a first step. Um, a Trojan horse? Uh, I, I mean, I would say it's that, but that... That sounds a little I, like that almost sounds like nefarious. You know what I mean? Like, I don't I don't look at it as a Trojan horse. I just look at it as it's their it's their first real step of like, all right, let we're going to get more integrated with PC now. And to be clear, I do think these games like let's again, we'll just go with the example. Let's say by the time Wolverine launches in holiday 2026, Sony has a PC launcher. You boot up that PC launcher on your PC, it's basically a PS5. It turns your PC into a PS5 is basically what it does. Um, you could buy Wolverine right through the right through it, and you could play it right through your PC. Um, I do think Wolverine will still make its way to Steam, but later on. So it's almost like another layer of timed exclusivity. Where yes, it's like it's on the platform. But now we're seeing like timed exclusivity through like storefronts, if that makes sense, which I guess already may kind of exist, I think. But that's that's my best guess on this, guys. Let me read these super chats. I've been keep, keeping you guys waiting. We have Chad A with a super chat here saying Sony already has an app for streaming games. They do, but if I'm not mistaken, this is for um, this is for uh, remote play which I say is very different from what we're describing here. But yeah, that is true. You can, you, yeah, I mean, it's, it's almost like, in a way, what I'm talking about kind of already exists on PC, just not natively. 
you can download the remote play app, I think, for PC, and you can just, but you do still need a PS5. And that's the big difference here, right? Is the difference between a remote play app on PC and an actual launcher, where when you launch this PlayStation app on uh, PC, you literally, you, you don't need a PS5. You don't. Your PC just became a PS5 by, by opening that app. Um, again, what are the implications of something like that for console sales in the long run? I don't know. I don't know. I do not know. And I don't think Sony knows. I don't think anybody knows. And that's the reality. Nobody truly knows what the implications are for the PlayStation console if Sony gives people the ability to literally turn their PCs into a PlayStation console. Well, it, I, I think there's only one of two answers that are going to be correct here. Right? Like it's just what's one of two things. Either it's not a big deal and people who play on PC are just like, nice. I kind of have a PS5 now if I you know, want to play PlayStation games. And I think console players are just like, wow, uh, never saw that, never expected that to happen. But I'm going to just still sit down on my couch and like, or my recliner and just play some PlayStation on my console. It's either that or it's the opposite. And like, people are just like, you know what? I really don't need a PS5. I'm going to buy a PC. I'm going to invest in a PC now. And I see people all the time. I see people all the time in my chat. I see them all over Twitter. I see them in my comment sections. I see them every, I mean, they make it sound like I'm going to go invest in a PC. Sony's pushing me to PC. And naturally that could make me think, oh, is that, is that indicative that like, it, it makes me wonder, is that indicative of the wider market? I don't know. I, I, we don't know guys. Like it, it's one of these things where you have to kind of hedge your bets, right? Like place your bets what do you think? Because I do, th I do think this is happening at some point. But the question of will the console be okay or will it not be okay? If I had to guess, I think the console will be okay. I think the console will become more niche. And I think that's fine. But I think it'll still do well enough. But I do begin to get this sense. And this is not a doom and gloom thing. I think it's just the reality thing where I do get the sense that when, you know, the more I hear these business executives at Sony and other companies, Microsoft, even Sean Layden recently saying that it seems like the console market has been fully tapped into. Like there's really not much growth beyond what we've seen. I am starting to believe that. And especially when I start to hear about younger generations of kids and teenagers where I think there are still plenty of kids and teenagers that play console or interact with consoles, but it is very much true that devices, you know, not just the devices, but what you have access to on your devices, it's becoming more and more of an expectation of your shit has to be everywhere. And if it's not everywhere, people are going to be like, what? Like younger generations, I mean. Younger generations are like, well, this is weird. But maybe but then again, like then again, I still think exclusivity is gonna be relevant. Like I I do believe that. Like I do believe no matter how I don't care how demanding a generation is of like, we expect this everywhere, that's not gonna suddenly make Netflix go, you know what? You're right. Our exclusive movie that we made, we're just going to put that on Prime Video. I don't think so. So I think exclusivity will still exist to an extent. And we got Hellbound 1981. Hellbound 1981 is like, you know what? Let's keep it going, man. Let's keep the membership train going today. He drops another five memberships for you guys. And actually, because of that Hellbound, I'm going to give Boss some more snacks here because he is a monster, dude. I honestly, you know what I think I did with these snacks, specifically these ones? 
I think Boss likes these snacks so much, he like hasn't really been eating his dry food. I think I may have spoiled him with these snacks to the point where he's like, this dry food tastes like shit, bro. Can you use this as dry food? I don't know. I'm a little worried about that. I'm not going to lie. But Hellbound, thank you so much for that, man. You just brought us up to 36 members on the day. So we're making our way, guys. We're making our way to another goal here. Let's see if we can end up hitting that at some point. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like, I don't think it's going to be like, oh, McDonald's is going to start letting Burger King, you know, sell Big Macs. I, I, I just don't think, I mean, maybe that's a little bit different, but I think that people fail to see that it's a bit more nuanced. It's a bit more nuanced all around where, yes, these companies are in the business of making as much money as possible. Yes, they're in the business of trying to appeal to as many to to as many people and making as many new customers as possible. But they are also still ultimately at the end of the day, no matter how much the competition changes, no matter how much the measurement of success changes, they are still ultimately in competition with one another. And because of that, I think there's always going to be this inherent need and desire to do something that your competition is not or cannot. And that will be the exact thing that makes people choose whatever your product is, whatever your service is over the competitions. Um, but let me let me continue with these super chats. We have Michael Lynch with another $10 super chat who says, didn't Sony already say they aren't going day and date? Didn't they say every game on PC will be about two years old? Why assume they eventually will? Well, there's a couple factors, Michael. You are correct. Um, I, be I believe you're correct. I think it was either Jim Ryan or Herman Holst, one of them, a year or two. It was, it was in the last three years they said something along those lines. I'm not going to quote them because I've, you know, there are many different interviews, but I do remember them basically saying that uh, in so many words that, like, yeah, we're not launching our games day and date on PC. I think it was Jim Ryan most recently, now that I'm thinking about it. He basically said that we are happy with like two to three years, like with like anywhere between one to three years, basically. Um, and he very much, you know, made it seem straight up that like, yeah, we're not going day and date, but that's just the thing. Jim Ryan's not here anymore. Right. And we're going to get a new CEO and the interim CEO is one of the first things he says is we're going to get more aggressive on PC. So these reasons combined Michael is what leads me to believe that this, while again, it's the, it's the timing. You're saying, why assume it will eventually happen? Well, the key word is eventually. That's, that's the key word because you're, you're going to see people right now today. If you go on the internet saying, no, it's happening. Like it's right around the corner. It's like maybe, but probably not. It, it, like, is it eventually happening? Are we getting closer to it? Yeah. It's it's almost like if you're driving to a destination, you know, and it's like you don't know how many miles away from your destination you are and you have to get you have to assume and you assume we have to be very close to our destination. But the person who's actually tracking it and sees how many miles away is like no, you still got like you still got like well over 200 miles to go. You know, like you're, you're very, you got quite a ways to go. You're not there yet. I think it's, it's one of those things. And the, and the truth is, as I said, the only person, well, not person, but Sony is the only one who knows how far away they are from this. You know, Sony's the only one that knows that. And I follow Sony very closely. And I'm just saying that, I'm just saying that to, to me, I, like I'm that person, right? I'm like, if I have to give my guess, like how far are we from that debt from reaching that destination? I think we have qu quite a ways to go. You know, could Sony speed the vehicle up and get there quicker? Yeah. 
But I don't think it's just like a, and we're there. You know, we've arrived. There you go. I just don't think so. I think, I think we still have time. You know, I think we st- we're not quite there yet. And uh, sorry, Michael, I, I saw that you used your milestone chat as well. And you, you're saying here they would only do that if games start to s- selling poorly. There's no sign of that happening. Mm, well, you're not wrong in that the mo- the biggest motivator for Sony would be if their game sales start dropping. Yeah, they would. That's then when they would put the pedal to the metal and speed the vehicle up and be like, "We got to get there quicker." Okay, like we got to get there a lot quicker. But you also have to take this into account, and this is this is just my view of it, uh, my overhead view of it. Trying to you know put my business hat on so to speak where sony wants to grow playstation wants to grow and and if there's one thing you can bet on at all times especially with bigger corporations like sony is they are obsessed with growth they are and they obviously like they boss your tails in front of the camera bro they have to be careful you know, just like any other business and any other company and any other big decisions that are being made. But I wouldn't, I guess what I'm trying to say, Michael, is I wouldn't assume that if a game like Spider-Man 2 sells 10 million copies in a couple of months or even like 12 or even 15 million copies, and it sells a lot of consoles. And it does just really, really well for Sony. I wouldn't assume at this point in time that Sony's basically just like, hey, that's good enough for us. We're perfectly content and happy. What I would assume is that they're they're happy about that. And they're like, this is working. But also, what else can we do? Can we get more? Can we do more? But I get what you're saying, where it's like, if if things are going well for Sony, then what is the need? What is what is the need to take that risk? Because that's the thing. I think that's Michael. I think that's basically what you're trying to say here, is that this sounds potentially risky for Sony because of the way they base their business model on the console and selling their games through the console. So, is there really a need? For Sony to take this risk if sales are doing okay. What's up, Shadow Link? Um, I try to just... I'm trying my best to just understand Sony corporate, right? To understand like how do their minds work? How do they view this? Because I assure you that how Sony corporate views PlayStation, views the PlayStation console, views the PlayStation games, views the entire gaming industry and landscape is different from 99% of people on the internet talking about their views of it. And that's the reality because everybody, including myself, talking on the internet, including everybody here, I'm assuming everybody here, I don't, I'm assuming there's no Sony executives here right now. We don't know what it's like to run PlayStation for a multi billion, you know, the most successful brand and product underneath a multi billion dollar, you know, global corporation. I don't know what that's like. And so I would imagine if I was in that position, my mind would function differently. Like I would see things differently. There's so much we don't know. And that's what makes this interesting. It's what makes these conversations interesting because we're trying our best to put the pieces together, right? And figure it out. But this is why I'm, I always try to be very careful these days. Look, I want to, I want to say this too. This is where I want to try to be careful and and cover myself. I'm saying I do think this is going to happen at some point. I do think a PlayStation launcher for PC is going to happen. I do think day and date for all games will at some point happen. But I also want to add to that that I could be completely wrong. 
For all I know, there is no plan whatsoever at Sony for this to happen. I want to acknowledge that as well because I don't like to speak definitively about things that I don't know the answer definitively. And I don't want people to get the wrong impression and make it seem like I'm claiming I know definitively. You know? And Michael, you're saying if things are going okay and selling, well, if they go day and date on PC, that will take away the reason for some people to buy a PS5. That's why I don't think they'll do it. And and that's that logic does track. Gaming Survivor, you think I'm you think I am dead wrong on this? I could be. I, I absolutely could be. We dude, we could we could go the next five years and Sony doesn't change their plans at all. I want to put that out there. Like Sony could be actually genuinely content with the way things are. They could be like, you know what? We're just gonna time our games on PS5 and when when the sales are maxed out, then we'll worry about porting them to PC. And when it comes to our multiplayer games, yeah, we'll just put them on PC. Not a big deal because we're not worried about sales for our live service games. We're worried about recurrent revenue. And they could just keep it that way, dude, for the next 10 plus years. And I don't think that sounds bad. If it works, I don't think that sounds like a bad idea. But I do want to remind you guys, and this is very important to point out as well. And I think this backs me up a little bit. Not saying that like, oh, I am right or I'm going to be right. But this is a very important thing to to point out here is if you remember towards the end of last year, we got a lot of information from that Insomniac hack. And one of the things that came out of that Insomniac hack was the revelation that Sony is planning to put PlayStation Plus everywhere. PlayStation Plus will be leaving the PlayStation console. It will be going to PC. It will be going to mobile. That is part of... It's like their like level three or tier three plan for expanding PlayStation beyond the console. That was... That's a real thing. Could, could the plans change? Absolutely. Could that be outdated by now? Maybe, yeah. But that's very important to acknowledge that like... This is this is how Sony is looking at it. You know? This is how Sony is looking at it and while there are no guarantees the the signs are very much there. The signs are there. And I don't think it has to I don't think it's a bad thing. I like I get again, we don't we don't know, but I'm going I'm going to assume that if Sony does all this stuff, they put PlayStation Plus everywhere, they expand PlayStation beyond the console, they make a PC launcher. They go day and date with all their games on PC. I want to believe that the console will be just fine. I do. Like, I want to believe it's still going to be successful. And that, you know, it's not just going to suddenly be like, nobody cares about console. The console's dead and done. And it's a failure now. I don't think it would work that way. And if it did, that would be very sad. And Sony would regret that. I think I don't, you know, if, if Sony really had the data, if the data told Sony, you will kill your console. If you do this, they wouldn't do it. I really believe that. I really believe if the data told them this will kill your console, I don't think they would do it because if, if there, if that was a genuine actual risk, like this is a real possibility that this could happen. I just don't think that would be a wise decision to make because it's like, oh, I don't know, man. You got a good thing going here with your console business. You know? Don't don't throw it under the bus needlessly. Exactly. Yeah. PlayStation is Sony's core business. Its survival is crucial. And they have to be very careful. Dude, this is why I'm saying... Hiroki Totoki is probably stressed as hell right now, dude. Imagine that. Imagine having to run the PlayStation business while also I got to find the right person to take over here. It's it's a lot. It's a lot. I, I'm not going to lie. I wouldn't know exactly what to do. 
it would be easy for me to say, just do what you've always done, Sony. Go back to your older ways and lock everything down. I don't know, dude. Things are changing. Things are changing very rapidly in the world, generally speaking. So it's like, then why is Nintendo staying far away from it? You're, yeah, that's true. And, and But here's the thing about Nintendo, right? Like, Nintendo has proven that they're not bulletproof and that no one is. Because again, the Wii U, in my opinion, will always show, it will always serve as a reminder that no one is safe, dude. No console manufacturer is safe, not even Nintendo. Um, I can promise you, if, if the Switch was not a runaway success, if the Switch was another failure, maybe it just did a little bit better than the Wii U, Nintendo would be a third-party publisher right now. For sure. For sure. But that's not what happened. Nintendo bet it all, dude. Nintendo's back was against the wall, and they said, look, it's sink or swim, do or die. This is either our last console, or this is what ensures that we can continue making consoles, hopefully for the foreseeable future. And they, they swam, dude. They did. They... They, they they made a huge comeback, probably the biggest we've ever seen in the console space. And the question, you, like, let me ask you this. Do you think Nintendo isn't scared shitless right now about how their new console is going to be received? That, dude, Nintendo is terrified right now about whether or not the Wii U, or I said the Wii U. I almost said the Wii U too. Shit. Nintendo is terrified, wondering if the Nintendo Switch 2 is going to be a repeat of the Wii U. And they have every reason to feel that way because the last time Nintendo had a runaway hit console success was the Wii. And then the Wii U happened. So they are very much afraid of making a similar mistake. And... Chances are these days, you know, things have changed since 2008, since 2013. If if the next Switch model... Boss, what was that, dude? <laughs> did anybody just see that? Boss just did like a whole fucking like 180 spin move there. Sorry. Don't think I've ever seen him do that. Um... <laughs> Boss, activate. <laughs> Boss Nintendo fanboy confirmed. But, uh, you know, if, if the Switch 2 sold only like 15 million units in a long period of time, like, dude, Ninten like Nintendo hardware would pretty much be done. Like, there's no way they could survive that again. I don't think so, anyway. Um, I mean, if they, they could, but they would probably lose so much money, like aggressively. But that's the thing is I think, the, I think the, the switch Two will be fine, but it's not that Nintendo is just doing things, um, on like completely unscathed. It's N Nintendo. I will admit Nintendo has, I think a different overall view of the way that they do business where I do think that Microsoft, certainly Microsoft, but also Sony, I think they are more shareholder driven to whereas I get the feeling that Nintendo, they are shareholder driven, but they also, they're more willing to be stubborn if they believe that like, no, like we really think like this is what we should do. You know, I mean, again, it's the company that made the Wii U and like nobody stopped it from happening. Like everybody agreed like the Wii U is a good idea. Like somebody should have been like, bro, that is not going to work. But that's kind of the beauty of it is in being that way, in being the way Nintendo being the way they are as a company is also what results in the Switch. And why something like the Switch is not something that Sony nor Microsoft would have ever thought of making and actually going through with it. So it, it's, it's this kind of double-edged sword where Sony 
and Microsoft, I think both kind of fall under the category of they are less willing to take big risks because they have this obsessive growth mindset where we know what the shareholders want. The shareholders want constant perpetual growth and we're going to align with that. I feel like Nintendo sometimes is just like, we want growth too, but we're going to do some weird, crazy shit when we feel like it. And if it doesn't work, well, we'll see if we can survive it. You know, I just, I just get the sense that that's kind of the way, like Nintendo's almost like kind of this chaotic, they almost, they almost have like this just kind of chaotic way of going about things where it's it is like a it is seemingly like very much a controlled chaos where they 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 come off like man they know exactly what they're doing but every now and again they just kind of reveal like oh my god they don't know what they're doing but then right after it's like oh no actually they know exactly what they're doing it's this weird dichotomy with nintendo from what i can tell that's just my outside view kind of looking in on it um but yeah there there is a huge sense of uh uh, you know, yeah, they are very conservative as well, Shadow Link. Yeah, like they, it's almost like when they decide to take a risk, they take such a massive risk that it's like, if it goes wrong, you're never going to do that again. Like, you're never even going to think of doing that again. I don't know. Nintendo's fascinating, I will say. Nintendo is a fascinating corporation. Um,. But we have Jerome Montgomery here with uh, two three dollars or two two dollars sorry three two dollars super chats, saying, um, "I'm gonna I'm trying so it's it's all right it's weird that PlayStation and Xbox uh, need PC but Nintendo doesn't. Why do PlayStation and Xbox need PC but Nintendo doesn't? And do you think the Switch Two will outsell?" the PS5. Well, first off, uh, when it comes to the Switch 2 outselling the PS5, I th think it could, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, 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 honestly, realistically speaking, I could see that happening. And I think a major reason for that will be because it will be cheaper. But also, I think Nintendo's IP just has, you know, like when they do a proper Zelda game and a, you know, proper Super Mario Bros and another... Mario Kart. I just think stuff like that is like, yeah, it's going to move a lot of hardware. But see, that's just it. You're saying, why is it that PlayStation and Xbox seemingly need PCC? It's it's a lie, dude. And it, it almost... Look, I don't want to get philosophical or anything or conspiratorial. I, I'm not going in that direction, but here's the, here's the way it works. Xbox and PlayStation, you know, we, we see the word need being thrown around like they need to do. No, they don't. We need like we need to we need to establish that these companies don't need to do anything. OK, like they have more than enough money to be OK for a long, long time. That's the reality. That's the reality. That's why it is laughable when people make it seem like. Sony's on the ropes or, 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 or Microsoft's on the ropes. Like, no, dude, trust me, they're money-wise. But see, Sony and, and Microsoft, the reason why there's like this conversation of like they need to do this, it's the equivalent of a rich person, like a very rich, wealthy person, um, feeling worried that they're going to lose some money. I, I have, I have, uh, I have $400 million in the bank account and I'm, I'm so afraid that if I don't find a way to get to $500 million, I'm going to drop down to 350 million. And what am I going to do then? And what happens after that? What if I drop down to 300 million? It is, it is a growth mentality. That to me, at some points, it's necessary at times, but at other times, it's it's just a double-edged sword, man. At other times, it will just it's it makes you totally greedy and and dumb, I think. Because the truth is, the truth is that 
that what I just described about that rich person being worried, um, a lot of rich people do function that way. And we like I would say like regular people that are not rich would laugh at that because it's like, oh my God. You know? It's all about scale, dude. Like that's that's what it all comes down to. And the one thing that Nintendo has pretty much remained, I would say, like ironclad, like just immovable, is Nintendo basically decided how they're going to scale. They they have not allowed, like my understanding of Nintendo, from what I can tell, is Nintendo doesn't let the shareholders determine how they're going to scale and how they're going to worry about the scale, the scaling up and down of their business, of, of, of the corporation. Nintendo says, we will worry about that and we will handle it the way we see fit. And you're just going to have to accept that as a shareholder. But please believe in us. Please continue to, you know, invest. Sony and Microsoft, especially Microsoft. Microsoft is the total opposite, dude. My, like Microsoft are just like lap dogs to the shareholders. Like they will do anything. Satya Nadella will do anything to please the shareholders. And if there's, if they go even just a couple years you know, we're like, we're not seeing the type of growth that we expected or that the shareholders want. They, they freak out about it. Same thing with Sony. And it is all driven by greed. That, that's the point. It, it really, at the heart of it, it is driven by greed. Um, I'm all about growth. I am. But, you know, you see a certain set of fans, because this is, it's Jerome. It's such a simple question that you're asking. Like, why doesn't Nintendo need PC? Because Nintendo said, we're just going to do... Laman, I got your message. I just... I'm, I'm slowly making my way. I'm, I'm a little bit behind. So just hang tight. Nintendo said, like, we're going to make exclusives and we're going we're gonna to tell everybody, you get those games through us and our hardware. Period. End of discussion. We don't even give a shit what the shareholders think about that. And in Nintendo, not wavering from that. But but there's something else to be said here, too. <laughs> Boss, are you okay? Sorry. Like I wish you guys could see what he just did. I have a glass of water here. That he attempted to drink twice and instead just accidentally inhaled the water twice and just was like, you know, like freaking out. I wish you guys could see this shit. I'm sorry. He's so distracting sometimes. <laughs> Go ahead, boss. You can drink that water. It's just plain water. If you're thirsty from your treats. I, I won't mind. I have my coffee. But... What I'm trying to say is that Nintendo Nintendo also has they they know what they have. That's so important to emphasize here in the difference between Nintendo, Sony and Microsoft is Nintendo knows how valuable their IP is to a point where they're like they know they have gold. And they know that everybody wants it and everybody is willing to pay for what they have. And unfortunately, I think Sony and Microsoft and especially Microsoft, they have not been able to establish this level of sheer confidence and will, mainly because let's be honest right now, neither Sony nor Microsoft have a Mario have a Zelda, have a Mario Kart. You know, they don't have this stuff, dude. They don't. They have some successful IP. Sony has successful IP, certainly. And, so, and Microsoft certainly has some too, but they just don't, they're not, again, Nintendo scaled in the right way where Nintendo put, I mean, for, for Starting from many years ago, Nintendo said the most important thing is our IP. 
we will treat our IP like royalty and we will present it like royalty and everybody will adopt that and it will become royalty and it will not waver. It will never be anything less than that. Sony and Microsoft have not done the same thing. They just haven't. And I don't, I, I mean, you could make an argument that maybe Nintendo was able to do this with their IP because it's more appealing to kids and all different ages. You know, I mean, it, it can something like The Last of Us, can something like Uncharted really, truly ever reach the same heights as Mario? Probably not. But it's it's just, it's a different, like these companies have different philosophies ultimately. And Sony is not going to. Hold on, really quick. You're saying I'm over here talking doom and gloom. There's nothing. Look, this isn't necessarily doom and gloom, just to be clear. I'm not saying this is a bad thing. It's 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 just these companies are different. And I'm just trying to explain that the reason why Sony and Microsoft feel as though they need PC is because they want to continue to appeal to the shareholders. And that's worth pointing out here is Microsoft and Sony are bigger than Nintendo. Um and and it, and they make more money ultimately. And and that's again that's because they are obsessed with the growth. Like they want, this is what the constant obsession with being a revenue leader leads to. When it, when, when a business is totally and completely ruled and dominated by, we need to make the most money. We need to make more money than anybody else. And we, every decision we make needs to feed into that. Then this is the result. You, you get you get just a, a lot of decisions that are made that are like, well, there seems to be very little heart and soul here. And that's because there is no heart and soul. It's about appeasing the shareholders and just obsessively chasing money. And I wish that it wasn't constantly like that. But it is. And I don't know if that'll ever change. Um, and I'm not saying that Nintendo isn't greedy. And I'm not trying to paint Nintendo as some great corporate. Like, look, Nintendo is greedy too. I'm just saying that there is a different, at the end of the day, like philosophical core like viewpoint of you will never see Nintendo just come out and be like, here's Mario on PC. Because they just, they're like, fuck that, dude. Like, our IP is ours. And we don't care if we lose some customers or lose a little bit of money. We're not selling that shit. Like, you know what I mean? Like, we're not, we're not just putting it anywhere. Period. And you kind of have to respect it, right? Where it's like, all right, well, fuck, man. You drew your line in the sand and you said... It, it, it's kind of respectable because think about it. How much more money could Nintendo make if they did do that? If they said, we're going to put our, our catalog of games onto PC. How much more money could they make? How much happier would their shareholders be? Just imagine that. And they're just like, no. It's, it's pretty Chad. It is. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a pretty Chad move, honestly. And that's what changed when Jim Ryan took over. Jim Ryan, he was more like the, you know, business-oriented, shareholder-pleasing type. Um, and, and who knows? Maybe one day somebody will be in charge at Nintendo. That's the same way. But it's, it's interesting to, to look at and I think identify these different... The different ways in which these com these gaming companies kind of operate. Um, and th there's one actually, 
before I move on to the next super chat here, there's one last thing I want to say just to bring it back around more focused on Sony and PlayStation. The biggest mistake I believe Sony might be making right now, and we don't know, we don't know, the biggest mistake Sony could be making right now is trying to convince themselves as well, as well as the shareholders that they can do both. I don't I don't know that they can do both. And what I mean by that is like I think Sony wants to believe that we can still sell the same amount of consoles in the same way that we have in the past and still compete you know at like a high level with maybe say how many consoles Nintendo sells um with the Switch 2 uh or or even with how many we sold to the PS4 and the PS3 and 2 and 1 we can do that while simultaneously forging this path forward to into PC into expansion beyond the console and by starting to put our games in other places that could be Sony's biggest mistake because what they might discover in the long run again it's a big might we we don't know is that it turns out no you're going to hit a crossroad where you need to pick one or the other and you it turns out like you just can't have both you're either going to go meet people where they are and say we're everywhere now or you're not and you're going to draw a hard line in the sand and say you come to us and that will never change and to be honest like i do think Sony has kind of already crossed that line with the Jim Ryan era where for four generations, that's the way Sony was. Yeah, they, they basically want to sit on the fence and it's just like, I at some point, you're going to have to come down and pick a side because, you know, up until the Jim Ryan era, Sony was like Nintendo in that way where they're like, yeah, you, you come to us. That's how this works. And nobody expected different. Now, nobody knows what to expect going forward. So, we'll see. We'll see. It's an interesting conversation. We miss Ryanology. Yeah, dude. I'm I'm gonna make like a a t shirt. Uh, when, whenever Hiroki Totoki announces the new PlayStation CEO, I'm gonna like make a t shirt that says the age of. To tokism or the dawn of tokism and it's going to have like the like 2024 to 2025 because <laughs> i think that's just so funny because it's just like i think it's funny that we've come up with this whole thing of like to tokism but he realistically he's probably only going to be in charge of playstation for like less than a year you'll wear that shirt in public gaming survivor Henry 3K, a member for 12 months, says, How's it going, MBG? The one crucial detail. Uh, the one crucial detail Sony absolutely needs to hit the nail on the head or hit the nail on is good and response a good and responsive UI in order to have people use the launcher. But yeah, getting back to the PC launcher, I agree. Um Sony, I'm telling you, the Easiest way for Sony to create a good launcher is just make the PS5 UI. Like just the PS5 UI is what you get when you open the launcher. That's what I think if they did that and they made it as fast, intuitive, and responsive as the PS5 UI is, I think they would do just fine. I think people I think people would actually be again, I don't think people would say like this is great. Fuck Steam. Like, no. But I think it would be like, well, it's not that bad. It could have, you know what I mean? Like, it's not, it could have been worse, you know? Perfect image with the $2 super chat saying, it all depends on the engines and the devs for people to go to PC. Perfect image is trying to squeeze in any, uh, any, any talk about engines that he can. I appreciate that perfect image. We also have Lam in here, a member for 10 months, saying Kingdom Come Deliverance 2 announcement in five minutes. God bless the family, MBG. The Bungie deal was a mistake. Will this prevent future uh, a future major Sony deal? Um, well, first off, thank you for the kind words, Laman. And uh, 
I didn't know that that announcement was actually happening now. I didn't play the first game, but I know people really liked it. Saying the Bungie deal was a massive mistake. Will it prevent a uh, major future Sony deal? It could. It could, yeah. Um, it was a big enough deal that... Uh, I mean, if Sony tried to buy somebody bigger than Bungie, it could be used against them. Um, and when it comes to the Bungie deal being a mistake, I still lean towards I think it might ultimately have been a mistake. But then again, seeing the turnaround that Bungie's having with the way people are talking about the DLC. I'm actually quite shocked at how much positivity there suddenly is around Destiny 2. And Destiny players have been informing me that this is kind of normal for Bungie, where apparently Bungie does their best work when they're on the ropes. That, you know, when it when it is sink or swim, that's when they start swimming, you know? And, uh, and that's, a little concerning, but also good in, in the sense that like, I'd rather it be that way than, yeah. Cause that, that's true. It's like, you know what they say? Like diamonds are made under pressure, man. And, um, and I'm not rooting against Bungie because ultimately I don't, I, like I said, for, I've have felt that like the Bungie acquisition was a mistake pretty much up until this point. And if it seems like they're about to turn it around, I'm going to root for that, even as somebody who's not really a big Bungie fan, because like Sony already made that investment. Like, I don't want to see Sony ultimately have to walk away from Bungie and Bungie basically slowly dissolve over time because it's just like, yeah, this was a huge fumble and mistake. And Bungie is just a shell of their former self and can't make good games anymore. I would not want to see that. So we'll see what happens with Bungie. Still got some time. Uh, we have Jerome Montgomery here with a $10 super chat. Thank you for that, buddy, saying, I don't think PlayStation's market is tapped out. I think they lost some market share to the Switch, which is why the Switch is passing the PS2 in sales soon. The Switch is a threat. You might be right, Jerome. And the reason why I say this is because earlier in the stream, we talked about how... Um, or somebody mentioned that there was a, a report that apparently Sony is already has already signed contracts with AMD for like uh, future native like hardware that's go, uh, handheld hardware that's going to launch with the PlayStation Six, and I think this is what might reveal some truth to this. Where I've just been getting this link, I've had this feeling it's been lingering for a while that not just the Switch. I think the Switch is a major component of it but there's the switch but there's also the steam deck and there's this these other handhelds where again like you do have something like the switch i've i've talked i haven't been talking as much about nintendo but when i have i've always and the, the conversation around nintendo is going to increase substantially depending on one major factor and this is what i've always talked about with the switch too is third party support Sony hasn't had to worry about Nintendo getting the same level of third-party support that PlayStation has. PlayStation has, honestly, they've been in this very um, comfortable position for a long time of they're kicking Microsoft's ass console sales-wise and exclusive-wise. So Microsoft isn't a threat. And it's not that they've been kicking Nintendo's ass. They haven't. It's just Nintendo has been busy with their own console that isn't really getting third-party support. So Sony just basically is like, we're kind of just getting this free win here, thanks to Nintendo. And Nintendo's like, whatever, you know, we're doing great. But that changes when the Switch 2 comes out and Nintendo suddenly is like, Sony, we're basically getting as many third-party games as you. To me, that's what makes Sony go, oh, yeah, we need a handheld right now. Like right now, we need a handheld. And I think I think you might be right, Jerome. I think that Sony has finally become aware that there's this weird situation where a person can go buy a Steam Deck and play God of War Horizon, The Last of Us, etc., Ratchet and Clank on a handheld 
that's not from Sony. And then the Switch is also selling like crazy and they have a follow-up coming that's likely going to have solid third-party support. I think those are very potent drivers for Sony. You need to make your own handheld like now. You do. You need to make it now. So uh, appreciate that super chat, Jerome. Definitely some good food for thought there. We also have Chad A here with an, a $5 super chat saying Nintendo and Sony cater to different disposable income demographics. Nintendo for young gamers, Sony for mature gamers. It's like Pitch Perfect versus Fury Road. That's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I do think that Nintendo definitely has that kind of inherent built-in advantage with their games and their IP of like it just automatically appeals to a younger generation. Um and you could argue, I mean, you're talking about disposable income and it's, it's true because it's like, it is, it does kind of come down to disposable income, but I just imagine like a lot, not most, but a lot of Switch sales, a lot of Nintendo game sales are from kids basically telling their parents like, I want that. And the, and the parents are like, oh, okay, you know, so it's like, I think that the money's still, Nintendo's getting all their money basically from adults, but they're just kind of leveraging that that younger audience, I think, just because the appeal is inherently there. And that that's why I feel like Sony, like, Sony, I hope you go big with Astrobot because you need that. Like, if you... Look, I'm not saying Astrobot can be the next Mario, but why couldn't it be huge? Why couldn't Astrobot be its own thing that could become big and a viable competitor? Maybe like what Pepsi is to Coke. Right? Coke being Mario. Maybe Astro can be Pepsi. You know? Why not? Why not? You think it can be the next Mario? I don't mm, I, see, I don't know about that, man. That's where I feel like Mario is like one of those it's it's one of those uh, properties and I it's one of those intellectual properties where it's like uh, I, I, it's just it's its own thing and it always will be. You know? Like there's nothing that's going to Take, like, replace it necessarily. But yeah, that's true. I do think Sony definitely appeals more so to the mature, the more mature market. And I just think that the, that just is revealed through their games. You know, like you would never see Nintendo make a game like The Last of Us. Fresh air in here. Say I'm firing shots at Nintendo. No, no. There, dude, there are a lot of adults that play Nintendo. Like a lot. Do you, I mean, I would love to know what, what the ratio is. Do more adults play Nintendo than kids? Nintendo's an older company, you know? Mario has the parents from the 80s and their kids growing up playing it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's like generational at this point. Um, so thank you for that, Chad. We have Josh Z here with a $10 super chat saying PlayStation and Xbox are trying to obtain universal brand recognition, which in my opinion is a fool's errand. Nintendo is the first to popularize games as a form of entertainment. That is something that nobody can repeat. Yeah, I do think you're right. Josh, uh, that's a good way of putting it where you're saying Xbox and Sony, they both want universal brand recognition. I I think that might be stupid. Yeah. Like I, I understand like the inherent desire to be like, we need everybody to know about the last of us and about Harai, about Kratos. Like does everybody need to know about Kratos? better question will you be able to achieve that you know like i i appreciate the ambition and i understand the driving force behind it but i i feel like these because what you're describing josh i think is the difference between organic versus inorganic in the sense of just things happen and you don't really have control over what like how they're going to happen right so like you're saying that what Nintendo did, you can't really repeat. And I don't... Look, I could be wrong here, but I don't know that Nintendo 
expected to do that. Right? Like we're going to popularize games and make them like a primary form of entertainment. Like we're going to save the gaming industry. I don't think that they literally went in saying we're going to do that and we're going to become universal. Maybe they did. But I feel like it was probably more like we just want to do what we do and we're seeing some good opportunity here. And so we'll go for it and we'll see what happens. And it's like, holy shit, you guys just saved the gaming industry. And and from that point, like the rest is history. And I feel like it's just one of these things where the more you try to force it, the more you try to force it, the less likely it is to happen. And the more... I don't know. It, it it just it has like a higher potential for just totally missing the mark because there's this we I think you guys kind of understand what I'm saying, you know? Where Sony honestly, I feel like it kind of it kind of does just come down to like you got to let the products speak for themselves and like once you put the product out there it, it's up to society essentially and 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 the culture to determine its place. It's like when you look at Batman today, right? Like Batman became a cultural icon, not because it, he was designed to be a cultural icon. Same with Spider-Man. They were not designed. Like there's obviously an intent where you want, when, when, when characters like Mario or Spider-Man, you know, when these characters are created, there's an intent you want to appeal, but there isn't this just kind of like, we're going to take over the fucking world with this shit. You know, that that's that's corporate thinking. And that's what sucks. That's usually when shit goes south and becomes bad because it's just like when 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 you remove the heart of what the product is supposed to be. And let's be honest, creators first and foremost create for themselves. That's that's how it is. Artists and creators they create for themselves because that's why they do it. That's why they have interest in it. And once they realize that other people like what they make, they consider that as well. It just kind of is like the icing on the cake, so to speak. And I feel like when you look at the corporate side of it, it's just straight up like, can we make it as universal as McDonald's? As recognizable as Superman? As a Superman logo? And it's like, what? You know, like that shit happens on its own. You can't force that no matter how hard you try. Like Call of Duty. Call of Duty didn't become a globally recognized like universal brand, the go-to shooter because when they what it like when Vince Sampella and Jason West, is that his name? When they were making when they were making Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare, they weren't like, "Yup, this is it." We're going to fucking take over and uh, we're going to change gaming forever. That's not how that worked. They were just like, let's make the best fucking shooter ever and that, that we've ever made. Let's just do the best we can and, 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 and make an awesome fucking game. And that's what happened. And then, boom, just like that, people are like, yo, there's no going back. So it's interesting to think about, man. Um, as I will continue to say with all things, there needs to be a balance. You can't let creatives who are passionate have complete control because then nothing will ever get made and nothing will ever get released because a lot of creators are perfectionists and nothing can ever be perfect. Um, you can't let the corporate side, the management side have complete control either because then it just becomes too hollow. It becomes too by the books, by the numbers, and just totally uninteresting. There has to be a perfect balance. Or if not perfect, because I just said nothing's perfect, a very good balance. And I just do fear. I do have a slight fear. Not I'm not trying to fear monger. I am ultimately optimistic, but there is still this kind of lingering fear of like There's this general fear that going into the next five to eight to maybe even 10 years of the gaming industry, 
that the the chasing of the revenue is going to become so uh like just i mean you could argue we're already there <laughs> i mean to be you you could argue that we're already there but it's going to maybe even get worse where it's just like i don't know i mean i, I to be honest i the more i'm thinking about it i'm stumbling on my words here cuz i'm thinking i think we may have already reached that point I, I like i hate to say that but think about think about the things that people complain about now and have been complaining about for a while where it's like how much does that skin cost oh 20 dollars Oh, okay. Wait, I have to pay forty dollars for the season pass for my single player game to get a, a mission day one. Wait, what? You know, it's. I don't know. I don't know, man. It racks my brain if I think about it too much. I just think. There needs to be better balance. There does. All right. So where are we at? We're at. Oh, wow. Okay. Damn. I, okay. I, I definitely lost track of time here. I thought we were at like two hours, maybe two hours and 15 minutes. We're almost at three hours. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to wrap up this topic in this discussion. I'm going to just give some conclusive thoughts. And I have one other main topic I want to talk to you guys about, although it's, it's going to be a shorter topic. But to wrap up my thoughts here, getting, you know, we went a little bit off track here, but getting back to Sony's PC push and day and date single player games, I do think that's going to continue, obviously. Like we're seeing that. Sony's going to continue to push into PC territory uh, and try to get even more established there. As I've said, I do think eventually, whether that be this generation or sometime next generation or maybe even beyond that, eventually Sony's going to make their own. Um, launcher that's when they're going to start selling their games they're basically going to try to con turn people's ps uh pcs into playstation consoles and they're going to do everything they can to continue to sell the console and have it do well and i think that's the direction as of right now they're headed in it could change though or i could just be completely wrong um and yeah that's basically it man um we'll see I don't I don't think we know what's after um I don't think we know what's after Ghost of Tsushima on PC. So you think they're gonna fail miserably? They could. Yeah, failure is definitely an option. It is. It's a or not an option. I don't want to say like they're gonna choose it, but it's it's a it's a potential possibility for sure. All right, so guys, we're gonna move on to the final topic of the stream. And before we do I want you to hit that like button for me. We are sitting at 237 likes. I want to see a big push here, okay? Let's see. I want to see a big push. Can we get to 275? I think we can. If we, if everybody collectively tries to get to 275, I think we could do it. I'd really appreciate it. Really helps the streams more than you know. And we are sitting at 36 members on the day, which is awesome to see. Uh, so we still have a little bit of time. If you want to get it up to 50... Let's see if we can do that because we are going to be doing a members lounge after the stream. The stream is probably going to be, I would say the stream is probably going to go on for another at most 30 minutes, but I think it will be ending before that. So we'll see if we can get as many people as we can into the members lounge. Um, but the final topic here is about Rise of the Ronin. I have a report here. And it says, Rise of the Ronin sales are off to a slow start, report suggests. So this is being reported by PlayStation Lifestyle. And it says, Publisher Koei Tecmo has announced a revision of its sales and operating income forecast for the current fiscal year, leading to speculation that Rise of the Ronin sales are off to a slow start. The notice, which was published on April 15th, 2024, doesn't specify which titles underperformed. As spotted by Reset Era user uh, Oregano, Koei Tecmo slashed its sales forecast by 11% and its operating income by 28%. The publisher allegedly missed its sales goal by about $70 million. Team Ninja's PS5 exclusive Rise of the Ronin happens to be Koei Tecmo's most recent high-profile release, so the aforementioned speculation makes sense. Some theorized that February 2023's Omega Force developed multi-platform game Wild Hearts may also be a culprit, 
but the monster hunting action RPG was released during the last fiscal year. So yes, it's, it's worth noting that anybody who, who, I mean, that's interesting because I almost forgot about that game, but somebody might be saying, Oh, it, it was wild hearts. That was the, it's the wrong fiscal year. Koei Tecmo will be releasing a detailed report in due course, but given the timing of this revision, Rise of the Ronin's launch performance is speculated to be the prime reason. The publisher previously suggested that it hopes the PS5 exclusive reaches 5 million uh, in sales. And so, yeah, I, I cannot... We cannot say definitively that Rise of the Ronin is the culprit because, again, it's not specifically named. But let's be real right now. This is because of Rise of the Ronin. Um, Koei Tecmo did say that they're, there's a high-profile release from them that they're expecting to achieve 5 million sales. They didn't name it as Rise of the Ronin, but we knew it was Rise of the Ronin. And, you know, again, you don't have to be a detective to figure that out. They expected Rise of the Ronin to, to sell 5 million. And I remember talking to you guys about this and saying, dude, they need to readjust that because this game is not selling 5 million. I, and this is coming from somebody who has been thoroughly enjoying the game on my PS5 since launch day. I knew before the launch, this game is not going to sell 5 million. This is a $70 title. This is not Ghost of Tsushima. This is not a first-party PlayStation game. I understand that XDev, Sony's XDev team helped develop it. Please don't bust through the screen, boss. You're not going to catch that bird. I know Sony's XDev team helped develop it, and Sony obviously funded it, and uh, Sony marketed it, but this game is not a Sony first-party title. And if you play Rise of the Ronin, for as enjoyable as it is, for as good as, as good as it is, it is, it doesn't hit that same quality seal that a AAA first-party PlayStation game would. It, it has its weaknesses. It has some flaws, certainly. But you're, the one, two, two, you're saying, MBG, is it 5 million in a month's time or in its lifetime? I don't think they clarified, but... I would assume it's lifetime sales, five million. And and it is, of course, like lifetime, it's a possibility, but it's worth noting that, like, again, they're coming out here readjusting their, you know, their their sales um forecasts and and dropping it. And they're doing so right after, like about a month after the launch of Rise of the Ronin. So it's safe to say that it's it's not doing as well as they expected it to do. But I do feel like even for lifetime sales, I, I feel like that's a bit too much for them, man. Like, And I feel bad because it is a good game, but, but I will, I'll tell you right now, man, when you play some of Sony's first party games, there's a reason why they go on to sell like 10 million or like 8 million or copies or something. Or sometimes... 12, 15 million, sometimes beyond that. There's a reason, dude. And that, there's just this extra level and layer of quality and polish that, again, it's no offense to Koei Tecmo or Team Ninja. It's not present in Rise of the Ronin. Um, it doesn't mean Rise of the Ronin is a bad game. It's a good game. It's a fun game. I've been thoroughly enjoying it, but it's just not on the same level. And... Uh, again, I mean, maybe, maybe five million sales. I mean, again, maybe it's possible, but I guess all I really feel like I can say at this point is I'm not shocked by this at all. Um, uh, to me, a more realistic sales goal would have been like three million, three point five million, maybe even four million. Um, but I guess the question is like. If the game is underperforming and it didn't do well, like how how bad like how badly is it underperforming? Right. Um, another question that always needs to be asked with exclusive games like this is how much different would the sales be right now if it launched on PC as well, or even Xbox? I I don't know 
I don't know that a game like this would have done that well on Xbox, but would it have been enough to keep this game at the bare minimum? And you guys know my feeling on this. You guys know how I feel about this. Like, I don't want to see games fail. I don't. And I'm going to be honest. I don't think if Rise of the Ronin launched on PC, I don't think it would be enough to really move the needle in a, in a truly meaningful way. I think it would help. I do. But I just think there's something missing with this game. Like, the best way I can describe Rise of the Ronin is it feels like a, de a, a development team said, we want to make a Sony game. And they definitely got close in, in a few areas. But generally speaking, it's like, I just, yeah, I don't think you guys are going to be able to do that. You know, like, I just don't think you're cut out for that. And that's just the general feeling I get. And I think because they decided, like, we want to make a Sony type game with our own unique flair. I think they also maybe kind of expected, like, we will get similar sales or or not similar because it's not it's not like they set the expectation of like 10 million or something, but just much better sales. And it's like, I don't know. I don't I don't know that this game is gonna appeal to people in the way that you think it will, that it's gonna sell five million. And that makes me again, it makes me sad because it's a good game, but you also have to wonder, what if Let's let's not talk about exclusivity. Let's talk about price. What if it wasn't $70 and instead it was $50? How much of a difference would it have made? I don't know. I don't know. What I do know is that it, it seems based off of this report that Rise of the Ronin, unfortunately, is struggling. And... Uh, I, I would say as of right now, the, the best thing to keep an eye on is how quickly it goes on sale. I do think that, that it would be uh, an indication. You know, basically, let us know just how much it might may or may not be struggling. It might not be struggling that much. I might just be assuming it might, it might actually be doing pretty good. It's just slightly underperforming. But if it is if it is really underperforming, we should see it go on sale sooner rather than later. You think it was the graphics that killed it? That could be a part of it. Sir, actually, I will say that is a part of it. Yeah, I don't think it killed it, but I think that it didn't help it at all. You're saying it's already on sale in stores? Really? Actually, let me let me go check real quick. And Zombie Fanatic, I'm sorry, man. I'm going to read your super chat in just a moment. Let me just go check this. Uh, on Amazon, it's still listed at $70. It says 4000 plus bought in the past month. Hmm. Well, we'll, we'll see. Uh, but Zombie Fanatic, thank you so much for the super chat, buddy. You're saying, MBG, have you heard about the Xbox YouTuber Septic Sauce? He talked about the next Xbox and how it being a hybrid cloud console could be good. Xbox are not in the best place for the next 10 years, in my opinion. I don't, I don't know that YouTuber, but um, I don't know that YouTuber, but I have heard the rumor of like a um a hybrid Xbox, like cloud Xbox console. And even like maybe a, it could be like a handheld hybrid. I'll be honest with you, Zombie Fanatic. It's very difficult at this point in time to feel like I can give any good speculation that's not just totally random about future Xbox hardware because all I know when it comes to Microsoft is they... They have a Series X console and a Series S that are beginning to sell so poorly that developers are questioning whether or not they should even port their games over to it. And on top of that, Microsoft is beginning to port their games to other consoles to, to make more money from sales. 
Um, so when it comes to like what I mean, I guess the best thing I could say is I th- I could see Microsoft doing anything. I think Microsoft might be in a position with the Xbox hardware where they're like, what do we have to lose? Do something crazy. Go the Nintendo route, right? And just do something totally crazy and different and unique. And who knows? Maybe that could be their savior. Just doing something that no one really... like. I mean, it sounds ridiculous to say it, but maybe a, a cloud hybrid console could be the next big thing. I don't know. Um, but you're saying here you think Xbox are not in the best place for the next 10 years. I think they're fine. Uh, honestly, like I I think Xbox has... A, I actually kind of feel the opposite of you, Zombie Fanatic. I think Xbox has secured their future for not just the next 10 years, but for for forever. I mean, not forever, but for the foreseeable future. And I say this because they they bought Activision and they bought Bethesda. Like, dude... Xbox could literally just become EA and they would be fine. You know, that they they paid like almost a hundred billion dollars for that safety net. And uh I just think that Microsoft, again, they're no different than Sony and other companies where like they want to try to have it all. And I don't think I don't think that's gonna happen. But yeah, I, I don't know. It'll be very interesting to see how future Xbox hardware turns out because it's it's very um I would say it's very unpredictable at this point in time. You think they could you're saying they could still screw up big time? They could, yeah. They could, certainly. I'm curious to see what happens more so in the long run with Call of Duty. Cuz I feel like I feel like Call of Duty for now, for like the next five plus years, at least, is a guaranteed hit for them. Again, like it's worth noting that a down year for Call of Duty is like 30 million in sales. It's like a down year, dude. Like that's when people are like hating on the game and saying this this game sucks. 30 million sales. It's it's a monster. Call of Duty is a fucking monster, dude. And like, I do think at minimum for the next five years, it'll be a mega hit, a guaranteed mega hit for Microsoft every single year. No matter what else happens, Call of Duty every November, guaranteed hit. But I do wonder if, I do wonder what the Call of Duty pipeline looks like underneath Microsoft management. We don't know what that looks like. I think we're going to get a Call of Duty this year, 2025, 2026. I think all those games are like already mapped out and they're already being worked on. But beyond that, I'm just curious like when it's when it's just like okay, like it's purely Microsoft handling Call of Duty now, what does that look like? Does it fall apart? I've said this before and I'll say it again that the Call of Duty uh, machine is an impressive one, if not um, a unique one, because 20 straight years, 20 20 plus straight years of just game after game after game after game and each one being a mega hit. Like no matter what, just each one somehow, some way still succeeding in such a massive way. I've always said that like that is not luck. Like 20 years straight is not luck. There's some there's some kind of there's something going on from a, a managerial level that like it's very, uh, I don't know how they're doing it. I don't know how they're doing it. And I'm just curious to see if, if, micro, if, if Microsoft can keep it up, you know? But it'll be many years, I think, before we really have our answer to that. But uh, all right, where are we at? So we're at like three hours and five minutes. So here's what we'll do. Um, 
we are going to be doing a members lounge for a little bit. So I'm going to let the stream go. I did finish all of my topics. I'm going to let the stream go for another five minutes. I'm going to end it at the three hour and 10 minute mark. Uh, so for now, I'm just going to talk to the chat for those five minutes. And it'll basically be like a last call for anybody who wants to gift some memberships or donate any super chats, any fan funding you guys want to do. We'll do like a five minute last call and then we'll move over to the members lounge. Gaming Survivor says, say something positive about the showcase. The PlayStation showcase is going to be the greatest thing that we ever see Sony do in the history of Sony PlayStation and no one's ready. And the PlayStation showcase is going to be so good. It's actually going to kill Xbox. Yes, I said it. I've said it. The PlayStation Showcase is going to be so good, it's going to actually just instantly melt Xbox. And we're going to wake up the next day after the Showcase, and it'll be as though Xbox never even existed in the first place. It'll be amazing. It'll be amazing. So, you, Ryan, you're saying, did MBG do reps? I do reps if we hit 50. That's how that works. I did feed Boss, though. We hit 25 members. So I, I brought Boss in. I fed him some snacks. And he's very happy about that. Um, but yeah, we're, we're sitting at 36 members. If we hit 50, uh, I'll do some reps. Why is that doing that? Anyway, Gaming Survivor, was that positive enough for you, man? I see Hickzock. Hickzock comes in and he drops a single membership gift. Thank you. Hickzock is saying, let's do it. Let's get a single membership train going. Hey, man, if you guys want to get a, a single membership train going, we still got a couple minutes here. Hickzock just brought us to 37. So, 13 single membership gifts. Well, we got, what? We have 288 people here. So, if 13 out of the 288 people watching, 13 people decide, let's do a single, a single membership train. We would get to 50. But thank you so much for that, Higgsock. I do appreciate it. You're saying it was a nice stream. I'm glad you enjoyed it, bro. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, I tried to keep it a little bit more organized today. I've been trying. Dude, chill. You're not going to get those birds, boss. Boss needs brushing. Does he? I get, yeah, he, oh, do you, do you see him in his hunting stance? Those birds are taunting him. And Sean Mitchell comes in. Sean Mitchell's like, we, we're going to do it, MBG. We're going to get to, he's going to help us get to 50. He drops five more memberships for you guys. Sean Mitchell drops another Thank five you. bomb. Appreciate it. He's like, let's do it, bro. Hickzock drops one. Sean Mitchell drops five. That's six. He brings us up to 42. So, guys, we are just eight away from hitting a second goal. Listen, if we hit that second goal, you're going to extend the stream by at least five or ten minutes for some reps. Really appreciate that, Sean. It was very kind of you, bro. So, yeah, we're sitting at 42. Um... We're doing good on the likes, too. We're sitting at 255, so I appreciate that, guys. Thank you. Boss, boss's tail's twitching. Yeah, he... He's, um... I, can't, I don't know. I opened the window because he seems to like the fresh air a lot, but he also seems to get really unsettled. Not Not unsettled, but he just, like... I don't know. He really wants to attack the birds. <laughs> and I get nervous sometimes that he's going to just explode right through the screen. 
And I wouldn't know what to do if he did that because he's never, I don't think he's ever been outside like that, but. Let me check something here. Let him do it. No, bro. I can't, I can't let him do that. I think he's he's smart enough to know not to do that, truthfully. Uh, Zoro Striker saying, "Do I know when the next State of Player show PlayStation Showcase will be?" Uh, the current rumor right now is May. The next PlayStation Showcase is going to be in May. So, Wes, you're asking how many dislikes? Uh, let me check. How many dislikes does the stream have? Give me just a moment. Not a lot, actually. Uh, 25. We're in 91.2%. So we're doing good, guys. We're doing good with the like to dislike. Which is nice to see. Do I think the new PlayStation CEO will be running at 60 FPS? I mean, look, if Sony wants to send the right message, if Sony wants to send the right message to the fans about the PS5 Pro, the next CEO should be running at 60 FPS minimum. Hopefully 120 FPS. That'd be even better. But yeah, it should be 60 FPS minimum. You're saying it better not be a state of play. I agree, actually. I 100% agree. Um, it, it'll be very depressing if we waited all this time and Sony's like, in May, state of play. I, I can't see that. I agree with William G. I want a real showcase. I want a real showcase from Sony. I want Sony to fucking knock it out of the park, dude. I do. It's been way too long. Last year's showcase, they need to... I think they need to make up for last year's showcase. MBG says Herman learned from last year. I think he did. I hope he did. Herman was running it. Sub 30 FPS last year, bro. He was running at like 26, 25 FPS. This year, Herman's got to be running at a solid 60 FPS the whole time. That's how it's got to be. All right, guys. Let's see where we at. Oh, okay. I went a little bit over. I went a little bit over. I'm at I'm at the three hour and 12 minute mark. So we, we'll, we'll do two more minutes. Two more minutes. And then we'll we'll head over to the members lounge. Um, so Sean, thank you for the five, bro. <laughs> Dragon's Dogma Two, a solid twenty eight FPS. It's amazing though. Do I think Sony's better when their backs are against the wall? I do. Usually, yeah. Yeah, I I do. I don't want to see Sony fail, but like, I just want to see Sony express a greater focus on their core fan base. That's what I want. I don't know if that's going to happen. I, I'm hoping it will happen. And I'm thinking it will happen, but we can't know for sure. I think the next PlayStation Showcase will really let us know whether or not Sony is putting a greater emphasis on uh on the core fan base or not. Cuz right now they're I mean they're not doing bad. They're just they're quiet, you know. They're very quiet, mysterious. Sean Mitchell says we just want to see the games do the talking, man. Agreed. I I absolutely agree. I agree. All right, let's see. So we got we got about 40 seconds, guys. Who's going to do it? Who's going to drop a 10 bomb in the last 40 seconds? I know one of you's thinking about it. I know somebody's sitting there right now thinking, am I going to drop this 10 bomb? 40 seconds to go. But yeah, just a reminder, anybody who's a channel member, as soon as this stream ends, we're moving over to the members lounge. The second stream is going to start. 
All right? Just for members only. So I hope to see you there. Also, I can't see the chat, man. Got 10 seconds, guys. 10 seconds. Now I'm afraid to end it. Now I'm afraid somebody's trying to actually fucking do it. And as soon as I end it, they're going to drop 10 membership gifts. Red Gaming Tech just put up a new video about the PS5 Pro calling it Cerny's Monster. <laughs> oh, man, that's uh, Cerny's Monster. I like that, though. Cerny's Monster. All right, guys, that's going to do it for the stream. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. I want to just make sure I give a big shout out and thank you to everybody who dropped membership gifts or became a member. We're sitting at 42 today. That's a huge number. Thank you so much for that support. And also, a uh, lot of super chats. Thank you to everybody who donated a super chat and also kept the conversation going in some interesting directions. Uh, one last call to just hit that like button as you're uh, heading out. And I also want to give a shout out to Devil Shooter, who does the timestamps for the streams. So, Devil Shooter, thank you so much for that, man. And now I'm going to open up the members lounge. So to all of my members, I will see you over there. And to everybody else, I will see you guys in the next proper stream. So have a good rest of your day and I will catch you guys in the next one. So take care. And uh, boss says goodbye as well.